This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. second core episode we're recording in one single day no brad will not also be leading this one we're being duties right oh my god <laughs> yeah brad you did a bang up job oh, with thank McKenna. you yeah i was already listening back to a little bit of it already posted it lots of fun and we're Good. gonna go to the other side of the pond to the gayer side of the pond this is going to be i i think this is We've already done Tennessee. Like happier, yeah. like joyful, frolic, no, frolicky episode? Or? No, no. I oh. mean gay. This is going to uh, be one of the, this is going to be a very gay episode of Art of Darkness, which I'm really excited to do. Uh, cool. To tackle that side of the pond, we brought on friend of the show uh, who has appeared on a couple of episodes uh, already, the uh, mastermind of Apocalypse Confidential, the coolest lit mag on the internet right now, Jacob Everett. Jacob, how are you? Hey, what's up, guys? I'm doing great. Ready to get into the dark, seedy underbelly of the Anglosphere. Ooh. Aha, that's Ooh. what we're that's what we're going to do today. And of course, this is what they would call in corporate America a low lift. In terms of darkness, <laughs> this one is totally obvious. Like Terrence McKenna, kind of a hippie yep. vibe. Yep. Yeah, maybe you had to go scrounge around for a little darkness. This one, the darkness is all. We are meat. We are all simply waiting to become carcasses. Cheerio. We're doing <laughs> the great English painter by way of Ireland. The painter who is widely regarded as the most important painter of the post-war period, <laughs> an English figurative painter, which flies in the face of the sort of dominant order of things in the post-war period where abstraction was ascendant, Francis Eggs, as he was known to his friend, Bacon. Who wants some Bacon. I love that his nickname is Eggs. That's hilarious. <laughs> yes. Yes. And of course, Jacob, uh, we're bringing you along for the ride here because when we first did Disney, I think it came up and we, we you and I are, we're simpatico about Jaws and you just, you just lit up when I mentioned Francis Bacon. So I'm really excited you're here. Oh yeah, definitely. You like, he's always an easy pull for, because one of the big parts of Apocalypse Confidential on my end is finding the header images. And, you know, it's always a low lift to, you know, when in doubt, just use a Francis Bacon painting. And so well, very familiar with it. And that's, that's great. And that will come up uh, during the episode because he shows up uh, in, in places that you might not expect uh, in yeah. that way. So I will, I will get to that later. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of things because we typically lead. Oh, you know what? We forgot to ask the, the closing question about McKenna on the oh, last yeah. episode, Brad. What would McKenna be doing today? Mm. Blast. Well, I'll just say yeah. really quickly that I think McKenna would be doing a podcast and he'd probably be very active on Twitter and he'd oh, probably oh, be. Uh, wh whether yeah. you agree with him or not, he would be excellent at podcasting. This is so just rapping and, you know, it right. would, he'd be very good at it. Yes. Yes. So uh, unfortunately, we forgot that question, but that's fine. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll hit it today. So we always begin our core episodes with a question for the other the other host, the host who isn't covering the subject. So, Brad, uh what do you know about Francis Bacon? Francis Bacon, uh, knowledge is power. Is a 16th century no, wrong, English no, philosopher. Oh, wrong, no, no, oh. no, possibly related. 
possibly related. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, no, wrong. No, I know it's not him. It's same same name, but uh, I, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about him. I mean, I I, I basically knew what you had said so far. Um, uh, a fig English figurative painter, post-war period, uh, grotesquery kind of. I, I, certainly, art that is that is uh, sometimes difficult to look at or challenging to look at on the darker side of things. I think of him. Uh, I f I feel like uh, H.R. Giger and he, while the art doesn't look the same, they. Uh, there's some kind of creative DNA that they share in common. I, I feel like, um, but beyond that about his life, I know very, very little. All right. Okay. <laughs> very good. Well, this is going to be fun then because you're going to, you're going to learn an awful lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to today. it. Well, so we always tease the after dark episode. Every episode we do gets another 20 or 30 minutes for the Patreon subscribers, patreon.com slash art of dark pod. And on today's after dark on the Francis Bacon after dark, we're going to find out which dictator uh, Francis Bacon claimed he wanted to be somdomized by. That's, that's a, a throwback to our Oscar Wilde episode. We'll say somdomized, <laughs> yeah. sodomized by, um, and he once loudly declared this uh, over, I think, a lunch to the chagrin of some prudish American matrons in London. Oh my uh, God. So which dictator <laughs> did Francis Bacon fancy? I'm going to start, gonna start and, making a list. Yeah, yeah right, okay. right, right. You, okay. th The answer will surprise you. Uh, okay. So you're definitely going to want to subscribe to the Patreon. Of course, you, you get an access to the entire back catalog of the After Dark, Dark episodes if you subscribe, including the one that Brad raps on. Yeah, I mean, that's right. That's right. You, there's no better value <laughs> online in digital <laughs> media, short of Apocalypse Confidential. Yes, there's no yes. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jacob, where can people find Apocalypse Confidential before we go? Before we start, Apocalypse Confidential is at uh, apocalypse-confidential.com, and then we're also on uh, Twitter at apoccon a uh, p o c c o n underscore mag m-a-g and that's all caps i don't know if twitter sort of cares about all caps but it's all caps anyway and then right. also we are on uh instagram at apocalypse underscore uh confidential there love yeah. it cool yeah. get those plugs in fantastic all right so <clears throat> For this episode, we're going to principally lean on a couple of memoirs. Uh, one is called Francis Bacon, Anatomy of an Enigma by Michael Pepiet, who uh, who knew him pretty well. Uh, you can see on the cover of the copy that I have here, you can see his studio kind of during his prime when he was uh, mm -hmm. probably by this point, he was either becoming famous or already had become quite famous. And uh his studio studio is insanely messy, <laughs> insanely messy, uh, which is very interesting. We're going to lean on that. Then the, the second memoir we're going to lean on is The Gilded Gutter Life of Francis Bacon by Daniel Farson. And uh, this is my this is my favorite of the Bacon volumes that I got my hands on because it's a deeply personal memoir uh, that reads something like a novel. And it's a bit of a you can tell that Farson really loved Bacon. And and was was deeply um, in love with him in a in a friendly platonic way, um, and Farson is an interesting character. This I'm going to read the from the back of the book here. Daniel Farson is the art correspondent for the Mail on Sunday and the author of Soho in the Fifties, Sacred Monsters, and a biography of his great uncle Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula. So he comes from a yeah kind of a. You know, the, the great nephew of the man who wrote Dracula was to become pretty good chums with Francis Bacon, which is kind of interesting. Fun. Bram Stoker has come up on like four episodes of Art of Darkness somehow. Yeah, I, interesting. I think we're going to have to yeah. take the Bram pill at some point. We're going to yes. have to do it. Yes. Uh, well, and then I also have a Toshin edition of um, uh, some of the the prints of some of the, the paintings just called Bacon by Luigi Ficacci, and I'll probably read a little bit of that. Uh, and then I have this absolute monster biography called Francis Bacon Revelations, which I'll pull on a little bit, pull from a little bit. Uh, cool. 
I'm going to do my best to keep this under seven hours. So, uh, Brad, I hope you're <laughs> six forty five at, at least. At, yeah. And, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to tell people, too, as we do this episode, the various uh, phases of his life are going to be punctuated by references to the work. Hmm. And so when I do this, I'm going to be sharing links with with Brad and Jacob and kind of asking them to describe the painting and what they see. So if you're not able to look up a given paint, painting while we're going, you'll be able to use the theater of the mind to mm-hmm. sort of visualize it. But I do encourage you, like the Bosch episode, if you're you know if you're at your computer or you 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 listen through this and you want to come back, you know check out some of the paintings that we're referencing and and his work because it's really. Um, uh, pretty staggering and uh, surprisingly an awful lot of americans are are not uh not hip to the to the bacon mm-hmm. um uh where you know where in in uh in england and, and in europe he he's a uh, be a household name within within um reason anyway um okay great so first let, let's talk about i'm going to pull anatomy of enigma of an enigma just to talk about how difficult my job is here today uh i want to talk about <laughs> how uh how hard this is going to be for me so let me find out uh, let me find the page that i wanted to read so he was talking about um he wanted to publish a book i'm telling this is michael pepiet wanted to publish a book with bacon uh and bacon had initially lent his support yeah you can write a biography of me but then he withdrew it because he was afraid of revealing too much of his life um now so and he also continued to speak with Pepiat openly about what was going on which is how this guy was able to write the biography but this is what this is what he says Bacon also continued to talk as openly as ever about his life in one of our last dinners together he went off into a reminiscence which suddenly filled in a few precious spaces in the patchy jigsaw of his past it might sound pretentious he said as he had said so often before but you see I have had the most extraordinary life the life is more extraordinary than the paintings. You would have to tell the whole story, yet present it in a way that would undercut mere anecdote. There it is, he concluded, flashing me the briefest of smiles. It would take a Proust to tell the story of my life. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to bust out the Proustometer. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't sound pretentious at all, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a wee bit, wee bit pretentious. Yeah, maybe, but, but that's hey, why it's we brought- earned. It's earned. Yeah, I mean, yo, when we get into this, it's going to be nuts. Like, I had to, at a certain point, just stop uh, writing my outline because I'm like, we only have so much time. Uh, um, and also, that's why we brought Jacob in because now we have two Proust's. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. We're like, oh, together, maybe we equal like a micro Proust. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Half a Proust. Yeah, a Proust. Yeah, a half a Proust. Um, so great. Um, before we get into the biography, I kind of want to just talk about and the work writ large. Uh, when we do these episodes, these core episodes, I sort of almost like to, sometimes I like to begin at the end. Like, what did this person accomplish? So we can kind of come all the way back home to the accomplishment from whatever humble or crazy beginnings um, a given artist had. And uh, and Bacon's, Bacon's childhood was um, fraught and troubling which we'll see. So this is from um, the Toshin edition, Bacon, Luigi Focacci. Here's what he said about Bacon's accomplishment. Perhaps no artist of the 20th century expressed in painting the tragedy of existence more realistically than Francis Bacon. This does not mean the dramatic force of an abstract condition of human life or the representation of something that might accidentally happen in one's personal life, but the inner and unrepresentable sense of individual and intimate existence. In Bacon, Rendering the sense of existence inevitably provokes a violently tragic expression. The tragic sense of existence is not a constant theme in every civilization, but it is a specific condition of European man in the modern era. And Bacon confronts it with such a concrete, penetrating, and truthful interpretation of human nature as to transform that sense into an imminent and disturbing reality. On the contrary, the objective reality of life becomes an appearance for him, which only the practice of painting can transform into a current and flagrant value. It is the reality of the work in its eternal present that the drama of subjective existential experience projects into the sphere of tragedy. 
This interpretation of the sense of human life mixed with explosive energy and desperation to the point of hysteria is much truer than any realistic representation. I'll read a little more here. Through its complete subjectivity, it cuts to the quick of an observer's most intimate sensibilities. Behind the growing awareness of the greatness of Bacon's work in the context of the 20th century is the fact that his paintings are anything but realistic in the sense that they are not bound to any particular representation of appearances or episodes belonging to a specific real event. Nevertheless, they are motivated exclusively by the experience of real existence in its most empirical sense. The reality of a transpired fact is resolved in the reality of the artistic act, the act of execution in a form. Yeah, mm -hmm. it goes on like that. We're not going to read too much from that book because it's a little academic and high minded, but I just wanted to give you a taste of um, the depth to which people have uh, plumbed the meaning right. of his work. Uh, and yeah. again, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. If I can just jump in. Well, and like the one thing that jumped out at me, the quote, uh, from Bacon himself is talking about the brutality of fact. And like, I think that sort of underlines the whole sort of, and it's interesting because he described his paintings and work as beautiful and striving to sort of depict beauty. But I think he had just such like a fucked up, like childhood that like his sort of perceptions were warped or maybe the sort of the beauty in it is the sort of violence um but yeah it's interesting stuff the brutality yeah. of fact i like i i'd like just contemplating that phrase for a minute that that's resonating yeah. with me yeah interesting. there are some good interviews you can find online with him we can hear him speak and see you know and see him um in you know engage with interviewers and he uh and some of them he's he's pretty well drunk uh and he he loved um drawing mouths he said he had never really quite achieved the perfect mouth that he wanted to draw but he drew a lot of people screaming a lot of shouting a lot of open mouths um he was deeply influenced and moved by the the famous scene on the steps in battleship potemkin uh and the the nurse with her eye shot out and that scream uh mm -hmm. is something that was to influence him and we'll we'll arrive at those influences as we go through the biography um brad did you have something no 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 okay but just battleship potemkin I, i'm feeling a lineage there but yeah this is mm -hmm. interesting go mm -hmm. ahead all right so i'm gonna pull just some biographical spine from the from the wikipedia and then dig into uh anatomy of an enigma when we're going to talk about this very troubled um childhood so uh francis bacon was born on the 28th of october hey it's almost his birthday 1909 uh on lower baggett street in dublin ireland at that time all of ireland was still part of the united kingdom uh we'll see this factor into his childhood because his family was uh protestant mm -hmm. and he came from a a pretty they were not wanting, um, particularly uh, Bacon's father married quite a lot of money and uh, they were the part of the sort of Protestant overlord class in Ireland. And uh, so we'll get to it. Some of his memories of childhood are uh, having to drive around traps in the roads because the the Irish rebels were trying to, tr you know, trap cars so they could, I, I assume, kill or take hostage um, the swells. Uh, so that's that's quite a childhood, basically growing up during kind of wartime. Um, his far uh, his father, Army Captain Anthony Edward Mortimer Bacon, known as Eddie, uh, Eddie, yeah, was born in Adelaide, South Australia, to an English father and an Australian mother. Eddie was a veteran of the Boer War, a racehorse trainer, and grandson of Major General Anthony Bacon, who claimed descent from Sir Nicholas Bacon elder half-brother of the first Viscount St. Albans, better known to history as Sir Francis Bacon, the Elizabeth, uh, Elizabethan statesman, philosopher, and essayist. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. um, Bacon's mother, Christina Winifred Firth, known as Winnie, was heiress to a Sheffield steel business and coal mine, uh, which is funny because uh, in the um, McKenna uh, episode we just did, uh, McKenna's mother worked for a steel baron. So mm -hmm. we're kind of I mean, roughly the same period of time here. Mm -hmm. um, Bacon had an older brother, Harley, two younger sisters, Yante, is that, is Iante, I-A-N-T-H-E, 
Iante. Sure. What a name. Yeah. yeah. And Winifred and a younger brother, Edward. Now, Bacon was raised by the family nanny, Jesse Lightfoot from Cornwall, known as Nanny Lightfoot. And they were to remain close until until she passed, uh, which we'll, we'll come to later. They moved house often between Ireland and England. And this created a, a sense of um, outsideness and displacement for Bacon that was to stay with him his entire life. He never really had... I'm getting a little echo. I just want to make sure I'm, it's not going to continue. Okay, good. He never really had a formal comprehensive, comprehensive education, uh, which we're to see. Uh, and it worked out for him, <laughs> thankfully. But he he wasn't somebody who lived in one place for 12 years or for eight years and then was sent to a boarding school and then went up to Oxford. That was not what happened to Francis, um, as we'll see. Um, uh, they lived in County Kildare from 1911 and moved to London. Uh, this is this is the period during World War One. Um, Bacon's father worked at the Territorial Force Records Office. It was like the the only thing they offered him, so that's what he went to do. His his father was curmudgeonly and irascible, and he was a, a horseman, a horse trainer, and 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 uh, a breeder. And if you're if you don't get along with people in that world, you're you're not going to do that well. It's it's not something you can kind of quietly do yourself and excel at, right? Like maybe you could be a great accountant without being a people person. You you know you have your. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, the, you got to yeah. be able to network and shake hands. Well, and there's there's just something so weirdly I don't know. It's like gr- out of like Greek mythology, maybe Oedipal or something like that, where something about like horse training, like a- aristocratic like horse training, because it's like such a specific up uh, to that time period field of work. Like nowadays, I guess horse, tr- like horse breeding would be a very boutique thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and guess, you know, not to get like too like, Whoa, maybe like, you know, some runoff from the McKenna episode, but like, yeah. if you like look at the horse, like once you start to think about it, it's like, it's a weird creature that like exists on this planet. And we kind of mm. take it for granted that it's around. And so, like, from the beginning, he's, like, rooted in this almost, like, Greek mythological kind of, like, environment. Uh, That is is spot on. One of my favorite plays is Equus, of course, the great Peter Schaefer play. There's a good film version. Yeah. uh, Well, we're going to get to that. And his first great breakout painting, uh, he he did say that I think he claimed that it was inspired in part by the Furies from the Oresteia and Euripides. Uh, hmm. So we'll, we'll come to it. Um, uh, in any case, I want to read a little bit about his childhood and then we'll continue on in the bio. Um, let me see. Yeah. Even though he did not often mention his childhood, Bacon acknowledged that it had been central to his whole development. I think artists stay much closer to their childhood than other people. They remain far more constant to those early sensations. Other people change completely, but artists tend to stay the way they have been from the beginning. Um, When talking amongst friends, the picture he gave of his earliest years in his family was extremely sketchy, but what came inevitably to the fore was his parents' lack of affection for him and his own natural waywardness. The episodes which he chose to recount were usually accompanied by manic laughter that it, that invited his listeners to share his hilarity as if the whole point of his childhood and his upbringing lay in their absurdity. Uh, so he was very unhappy. And of course, you have to you have to know we're talking about a great uh, a great drinker here. Uh, so this is going to be one of the boozier episodes uh, of um, of Art of Darkness. He. So he was raised around these horses uh, and in this sort of country life. And, the, and his father had chosen Ireland because he could stretch his wife's fortune, her dowry farther in Ireland. So it was somewhat somewhat provincial relative to what they, you know, if they had stayed in England or settled in England, it was just sort of cheaper to be there. It's like the difference between maybe like Ohio or upstate New York, right? Yeah. Um, or like, you know, in the vicinity of Manhattan. Um, he had asthma. And this this asthma was to affect him his entire life. And people postulate that his obsession with um, uh, 
with mouths and this sort of like gasping horror could relate to his his having suffered from asthma his entire life. Um, so let me see here. I want to read a little more about his um, about his childhood. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he lost one of his brothers. So let me mm. see. Disaster was the leitmotif of nearly every memory Bacon chose to bring up when he talked about his childhood. To be sure, it struck the Bacon family on several occasions. Their youngest son, Edward, suffered from a weak chest like Francis, but he was not endowed with the same resilience. So we're flashing forward here a little bit. Hey, what's he, what's weak, weak chest? Is lungs? As, asthma just didn't uh, have. Okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Francis couldn't be around the horses. He couldn't be around dogs, hmm. uh, you know, and uh, when he finally did escape, the country he never went back he was he became mm. a creature of the city mm. um when it was all said and done but in, uh but in 1927 uh edward died and that was the that devastated um uh francis's father one of his cousins remembered those things were heard and never discussed you were just supposed to get on with your life francis himself was convinced he knew why edward had died Edward had started going to the same school as I did, Dean Close in Cheltenham, and they asked for him to be taken away because he had been going along with other boys. And then he developed tuberculosis, which, as you know, can be an emotional thing. There was no cure for the disease then, and he died. So Bacon's theory about his brother is that he was also uh, homosexual, Mm -hmm. going to the same school, and Francis was to end up essentially getting he quit the school before they could expel him because mm. I mean, this is, this is the British public school system, which is the private school system over there. It's just famous for, for this thing. Yeah. Even then that, that was known. So huh. um, I want to read about one of his earliest memories. Bacon's earliest memory, the earliest memory went back to the eve of the first world war. He was marching up and down an Avenue bordered by cypress trees, exulting in the magic conferred on him by his brother's cycling cape. Disguise and concealment were frequent sources of delight. He rem- remembered vividly hiding behind trees with two little girls because they thought Reggie, an older boy they had met at children's parties, was after them. He's coming. He's coming. We used to tell each other, Bacon recalled. He never came naturally. And in a way, we knew perfectly well he wouldn't. But for some ridiculous reason, we used to love hiding there and pretending he might find us. Of course, being older, he was far too important to be bothered with us. Uh, There was also the thrill of lying in bed, a small boy in an Irish country house, listening to the sounds of bugles and hearing British cavalry from the Curragh on maneuvers in the woods outside. It would not have been difficult for an imaginative child to visualize the splendidly uniformed men as they wheeled their horses round and crashed past each other in the dark. On one occasion, that remained alive in Bacon's mind. A cavalry de- detachment rode up and down the driveway to Candy Court before fanning out on a practice mission. Um he just loved it. And what he said was, I, I was brought up for much of my childhood on the edge of a very flat marshlands full of snipe and plover, he recalled. That's the kind of country I find exciting. Um, so I w- there's a little bit here, too, about um, Ireland and sort of the scene that was going on there. So uh, let's read a little bit about that. Throughout Bacon's boyhood, Ireland was a scene of a of deep and uh, uh, deep social and political unrest as the movement for independence from Britain, represent, uh, represented by Sinn Fein, gathered strength, culminating in the Easter Rising of 1916. Uh, once the IRA was formed in 19, 1919, guerrilla warfare broke out. As Bacon went through boyhood, the rebels post an ever great a greater threat to landowners, particularly those like the Bacons living on isolated estates. The growing number of attacks on British military barracks were accompanied by raids on large private houses. Now imagine uh, you're a boy. Yeah. World War I has come to an end. You were in London. Now you're back. You're out in the middle of nowhere, kind of, mm. like as far as that goes in Ireland. Mm. You were pillaged and frequently destroyed. The wow. atmosphere of threat and violence, the fear of the sniper in the woods and the hidden bomb made an indelible impression on Francis and shaped his early awareness of the outside world. Later in life, when asked uh, asked about the violence in his paintings, he would often recall the tensions that had plagued Ireland throughout his childhood. Francis had been, above all, conscious that his family represented the enemy. And he was forever being cautioned by his father not to talk to strangers and to keep an eye out for anyone roaming around the house. 
Eddie Bacon was particularly worried that his horses might be stolen and used by the IRA or that his children would give away some useful information. If they come tonight, he would admonish them, say nothing. Whoa, we're the baddies. We're the <laughs> yeah. baddies and we're under we're in danger. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting to like remember that like Ireland then was yeah, it's basically like hostile occupied territory. And we kind of forget that because like, you know, like Irish people look like English people, you know, more mm-hmm. or less. And like, but like it's sort of the same it's basically the same thing in principle as like uh apartheid era south africa or like british raj india but, but those but are like, more imp- apparent because the but, people look mm, different but it's right. like the same thing Ireland. but this is already post genocide like if you talk to yeah. I, like irish there this is like the oh, yeah. genocide has already happened uh yeah, ireland yeah. ireland had a bigger population up until recently in the in like the 18th century, the early part of the 19th century, like the population has only now come back. Yeah, between uh, deaths, deaths and emigrating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very interesting. I want to read um, uh, the a uh, little bit here. One incident that was engraved on Bacon's memory took place at night when he was driving home with his grandfather. Their car got stuck in the well-named Bog of Allen, a site much favored by the rebels because it served as a natural trap for vehicles. As the lean, tough-looking uh, police officer and the frightened boy abandoned the car, the darkness came alive with flashing lights and the wild hallooings which relayed the accident from one rebel group to another. Fortunately, the two were able to find their way to a big house nearby whose owners, guns in hand, cross-examined them before giving them refuge. Uh, th- th- I'm going to go on. An awareness of life as a perpetual hunt, the stalker and his prey, the aggressor and his victim was to be fundamental to Bacon. It was implicit in all his images, not only in the obvious example of his coupled figures lying entwined as if in mortal combat, but in the more general context of the observer and the observed. Very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Later on, Bacon put into his pa- painting certain figures called attendants, whose only apparent function is to watch. Their motive could equally equally well be sexual excitement or like the hidden snipers, the desire to destroy. Um, Yeah. So just getting a little taste of his childhood. We haven't really um, even quite talked about uh, the the family, but can you, I mean, yeah, he kind of grew up in a, in the middle of a, not a civil war per se, but a kind of colonial. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, struggle. Hostile mm-hmm. territory for sure. Yeah. The, the, wow. That's, that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then you can kind of see his work is, is, is like karma from this or something. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, this is, I'm in, I'm in, this is awesome. Yeah. We're going to uh, talk to, about <clears throat> two major uh, things that impacted his life. We're going to talk about his asthma and his homosexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, This is all at this point coming from the Pepiat Anatomy of an Enigma. Uh, Bacon's lifelong asthma is an important key to his childhood and to his adult sensibility. Asthma ran in the family, and in later life, Bacon frequently toyed with the idea of living for part of the year in a dry climate, like his uh, maternal grandfather um, had done by spending the winter in Egypt. Um, For an asthmatic, the simple process of breathing is a struggle. Each attack is an ordeal to be overcome. And during his childhood, little existed to alleviate the suffering. Um, Nevertheless, asthmatics generally acknowledge their condition sharpens the will to live, making mere existence what Bacon used to call conscious life a pleasure in itself, since it has been so arduous to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, If you want your if you want your kids to appreciate life. Make sure they get asthma. <laughs> you make sure they're asthmatic. Of... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, maybe a bit of a stretch, but I, I can no, see, I can see that. No, I can see that for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's like a re- reverse Gattaca situation. Make sure they have at least one flaw going on. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, the other even more dominant factor in the boy's life, especially as he approached adolescence, was the growing awareness of his homosexuality. Its importance to Bacon's development, to his later life, and his vision as a painter cannot be overstated. One might reasonably say that along with his dedicated ambition as an artist, his sexuality was the most important element in his life. Bacon would refer to himself as completely homosexual. (laughs) 
<laughs> someone for whom no doubt or wavering had ever existed. He himself <laughs> recounted one banal, youthful attempt at heterosexuality with a prostitute who apparently ate chips uh, while her client attempted intercourse, which I, I assume would be fries. She's eating yeah. French fries. He's trying to stup her. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and he is but, but i mean that might have been a big enough that might have sent him the other way just yeah right you know. yeah the, yeah <laughs> and he is reputed to have had sex once and unsatisfactorily with one of his favorite female friends and models isabel rossthorn mm. so he, he he banged one of his friends one time and it wasn't very good and one mm. of his lady friends and it was just men for for the rest wow. of his life okay. he uh, uh jacob have you ever heard what his ideal how he described his ideal man oh uh, no i can't recall he he said the nietzsche of the football team <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> so so masculine right man, like he, yeah as we're going to see he fancied he would rather be with the truck driver than mm-hmm. like the the twink or right. the good looking socialite. Mm. Uh, eventually, we're going to get to t- two of his major love affairs: one with a a Royal Air Force pilot named Peter Lacey, and then another one with a East End thug named George Dyer, who Daniel wow. Craig plays in a very fine movie about Francis Bacon called Love Is the Devil. If you want to see pre James Bond Daniel Craig in a homosexual role uh opposite i can't remember the name of the actor but opposite from his character is opposite francis bacon love is the devil streaming on amazon it's actually quite a good quite a good film mm. is um, it steamy uh it's um it's kind of an art film okay I'm just yeah. Curious. yeah yeah it's it's a little steamy yeah <laughs> yeah it's i feel like it captures the aesthetic of bacon and the vibe in a pretty good way it's like a it's like a quick 90 minute shot of bacon okay um, okay yeah. So, yeah. So, going on about the sexuality, uh, these two heterosexual incidents were the exceptions that prove the absolute homosexual rule. From as far back as I can remember, I used to trail about after the grooms at home. So, of course, his father's raising horses, and his father had a stable of horses. His father also had a stable of grooms. Um, Bacon would say, uh, I just like to be near them. Hmm. That these Mm -hmm. grooms with whom he admitted to having sex in his early teens were also the ones who horsewhipped him is attempting conjecture in the light of Bacon's sadomasochism and the tangibly violent sexuality that suffuses so much of his imagery. If indeed his father, now this is important, Bacon despised his father, but admitted he was sexually aroused by his father. So Bacon was very in tune with his Oedipal mm. Freudian mm. garbage. Um, so if indeed his father, to whom he was sexually drawn, ordered and witnessed the floggings carried out by the grooms, themselves a source of erotic excitement, then the complexity of emotion of pain, thrill, and humiliation is sufficiently extreme to make any later violence in life or on the canvas almost too easy to explain. Um Wow, so he okay. was, yeah, he was broken in by the grooms in his father's stables and probably whipped and got into, he was there's, a masochist. Yeah, there's a cauldron of psychosexual development happening here. Interesting. Okay. Okay. He And he loved to be hurt. Wow. To the degree where later in life there would be incidents where there was one story I can't recall who it was, but it was later. He 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 would show he showed up to the point where his friend said, "You need to go see a plastic surgeon." Really? He had like his like his eye knocked out at one point in Jesus. like from like a a drunken row, like a beating. See, wow. because it was with Bacon, the line between like play and then these these egregious over the top fights was blurred um, mm-hmm. with some frequency. Um, Later on, Peter Lacey th- throws him out of a second story glass window. Wow. And Bacon only loved it, loved him more for it. Um, wow. but a fr- well, you a can friend- see his older photos. He when he's an older man, he looks slightly disfigured. I, yeah. I wouldn't have said that until you brought this up, but he does look slightly yeah. misshapen. Yeah, right. he looks like one of his paintings. He does, yeah. Interesting. 
Well, and these things would happen at the hands of his of his lovers, and that's what he looked for. He looked for somebody who would frankly beat the shit out of him. Oh. Uh, and yeah, a friend said, you know, you know, Francis, you have to go, you know, to a plastic surgeon, and he tried to help Francis, and Fra- Francis got angry, and that's when the friend realized, oh my god, he likes he likes the pain. He wow. likes the pain. He, he's he's the true he's the one true masochist that we've covered. Yeah. So far, I can't think of another figure we've done who's truly a masochist. Yeah. Um, and consciously so. Right. Uh, which which will seeking which we'll it out get to. and yeah yeah yeah. I want to read a little more about the sexuality because it's pretty essential to understanding um, Francis Bacon. Frankness about himself and his tastes was a constant in Bacon's conversation, but although he accepted his homosexuality fully and made no attempt to disguise it, he openly regretted it on occasion. Being a homosexual is a defect, was the way he put it in certain moods. It's like having a limp. It is not clear whether his initiation to sex came from the stable boys or from encounters at boarding school, but from around the age of 15, Bacon would have been more precisely aware of the nature of his sexuality than most of his contemporaries. Um, I, that's one take I'm, I've read around and I'm pretty sure, you know, it was, it was going on at home, um, in the stables and things. Uh, so let's get into a little bit of his school time. Um, I want to see here. Hang on. I want to make sure I'm getting the right. Okay. Hang on one second. Oh, I just imagine this on top of being, okay, so you're a homosexual. That's, you know, that's a thing. That's, that's, but but believing you believe, and other people might think you're defective, but you think it's a defect. That has got to be a hard road to hoe. You know what I mean? Just, you can't do anything about it. You can't change it. Um, Your attempts to do it are going to fail. And yet you, uh, yeah. yeah, that's rough. Well, we're, it really is. Um, I'm going to read a little more from the wiki bio, and then I want to read about his schooling, and uh, then we're going to get him out of there uh, and get into Europe. Save um, him. Rescue him. Yeah, yeah. We got to get him out of there. <laughs> out of the fire and into the, uh, I, I guess, uh, what's that, What's the saying? Out of the- Out of the frying whatever. pan and into the fire. Yeah, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Yeah, for, for bacon. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, that bacon, out the pan. <laughs> oh. bacon was shy as a child and enjoyed dressing up. This, in his effeminate manner, angered his father. A story emerged in 19, 1992 of his father having had bacon horsewhipped by their grooms. In 1924, shortly after the establishment of the Irish Free State, his parents moved to Gloucestershire, first to Prescott House in Gotherington, then Linton Hall near the border with Herefordshire. Herefordshire. Sorry, Anglos. Uh, and I'm cheering for the IRA. They drop Kidding. whole syllables. I think it's Gloucester and <laughs> Herefordshire or something. <laughs> Gloucestershire. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it sounds like something I put on a steak. Um At a fancy dress party at the Firth family home, Cavendish Hall in Suffolk, Bacon dressed as a flapper with an Eaton crop, beaded dress, lipstick, high heels, and a long cigarette holder. All right? So imagine Father Bacon, and here comes Francis, dressed up as a flapper. Yeah, that's I'm just cringing at the reaction that this is going to cause from other people. Oh, my God. Well, the, the women loved it. Sure. The women sure. thought he was he was a a laugh. Yeah. Um, in 1926, the family moved back to Straffan Lodge. Now, this is around the time he was getting out of this schooling. So, I want to read the schooling. So he uh, he ended up at a place called Dean Close School in Cheltenham from 1924 until April of 26. So, from the age of about 15 to 16, 17. Uh, on arrival at Dean Close, Francis was put into Brook House, or Ellums, as the house was called, after the master who ran it at the time. Bacon thought little of the teaching he received there, and indeed of the school itself, a minor public school, he insisted witheringly. And again, over there, public is private. Mm. Um, but this 18-month period nevertheless marked an important phase of his sentimental education. My parents did this awful thing of putting me at Dean Close in midterm. He told me with undisguised gusto. So I was led with them right the way down the dining hall where the whole school was sitting. And of course, what's called the conversation, uh, or sorry, what's called all conversation stopped and everybody just sat and stared at me. 
I felt I was finished after that. And once I was there, I just went wandering up and down the corridors, up and down the whole time, not daring to talk to anyone. Then this very nice looking boy. Oh, got an echo there. Hang on. Then this very nice looking boy came up to me and said, you can be my friend if you like. Of course, I had no idea what he really meant by being his friend. I thought, how nice to have a friend. Then this other friend, a Persian boy, came along who had developed early, as they say. It was all rather ridiculous, my life at school. But then for some reason, I had always known that life was ridiculous. Even as a child, I knew it was impossible and futile, a kind of charade. I was a complete fool. I could never learn anything, but a sophisticated fool. And so I became a sort of clown, and I got by because I amused the other boys. In the end, I left Dean close just before they asked to have me taken away. So oh. at that point, he's he's partaking of the, the fruit, if you will, um, mm-hmm. already. And he, he lasted 18 months. And as far as I can tell, that was the most formal schooling he was to ever receive. So, so you said 16, 17 years old? Yeah, 15 yeah. to yeah. 16, 17. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. Uh, so in uh, in 1926, the family moved back to Straffen Lodge. His sister, Yante, 12 years his junior, recalled that Bacon made drawings of ladies with cloche hats and long cigarette holders. <laughs> he would make these for his mother. Um, mm-hmm. Later that year, he was thrown out following an incident in which his father found him admiring himself in front of a large mirror wearing his mother's underwear. But so... <laughs> Yeah. yeah are we i'm we, we're not having to uh clamor around for darkness no. uh here yeah <laughs> nope so yeah he uh he was expelled from home so bacon regularly recounted this final break with his father as if nothing could be more hilarious a particularly absurd chapter in what he called his ridiculous and ghastly life but his father's disgust and dismissal wounded him deeply in a way that he was never able to forget. Before his life had really began, he had been rejected by his own kin and branded as an outsider. The extreme humiliation in someone who, even as an adolescent, was not unaware of his superior gifts would find expression in an equally potent rage, which encouraged him to rebel against his father's world with all its claims to great ancestors and cause a shock as sharp and enduring as the pain it had given him. Despite his sensitivity, his wayward instincts, and his brilliance, the son was to prove tougher and more unrelenting than the father. Having been made an outcast, the defiant young man set himself in fearsome opposition. Nothing could have concentrated a naturally refractory temperament better. From the moment of his rejection, Francis Bacon set out to take rebellion to its furthest extreme. And that that pretty much ends the childhood. Right. So I think that that ends kind of part one. We haven't even really got to any of the paintings yet. And we won't for a minute because Bacon started painting rather late in life uh, and was was largely self-taught. This this next kind of phase that we're going to go into is London, Berlin and paris and now we're going to get into berlin and paris and london like in the 20s and in the, in the 30s uh, pretty that's, fun this, that's this, a mm-hmm. scene that's a total scene yeah yep perfect yep. environment for bacon yeah oh yeah. just the just the best uh oh, yeah. so there was a little period in london where he was you know he had been expelled from home now he has to go to london boohoo uh mm-hmm. so big ba- my favorite town Bacon spent the latter half of 1926 in London on an allowance of three pounds a week from his mother's trust fund, reading Nietzsche. Although poor, five pounds was then the average weekly wage, Bacon found that by avoiding rent and engaging in petty theft, he could survive. That'll work. Uh, that'll that'll do it. <laughs> he would take a room, would leave, would not mm. pay the rent, uh, and he would he would thieve things. Yeah. To supplement his income, he briefly tried his hand at domestic service, but although he enjoyed cooking, he became bored and resigned. Uh, there's a funny story there where he he was doing uh, breakfast and dinner at some person's house, I think in like Chelsea or in Kensington or whatever, uh, and, and then he ended up getting fired because the the, the master of the house saw him dining out at a fancy restaurant and like ended up at a table next to him. 
<laughs> he just couldn't stand the idea of like, be, why is my <laughs> right. servant at this? It's just too awkward, too strange, right? And <laughs> oh, it, that class France, stuff is so deep. We don't really even well, understand it in America. Yeah, no, not at all. Not, class like, not the way they have the, it. The way we're racially conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, class yeah. is like everything. Uh, they, um, and I assume, and, and maybe I'm telling the anecdote wrong, but I, I would guess that Francis was probably being taken out for this mm -hmm. fine dinner, if you take my take my meaning. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was another time where he quit a job and the 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 person his boss was like i don't know why he would quit he didn't do anything anyway <laughs> wasn't doing anything anyway it was some sort of <laughs> household type job and he just you know um he was sacked from a telephone answering position at a shop selling women's clothes in poland street soho after writing a poison pen letter to the owner mm. uh so and soho is to figure massively soho is this great famous queer epicenter in london uh yeah on poland street i i know this area well um lots of lots of clubs lots of theaters lots of restaurants it's very central and still still kind of fun if you're ever in london you definitely want to go see soho um bacon found himself drifting through london's homosexual underworld aware that he was able to attract a certain type of rich man something he was quick to take advantage of, having developed a taste for good food and wine. Um, one was a relative of Winnie Harkett Smith, another breeder of racehorses who was renowned for his manliness. Now, <laughs> he's going to come back in a little bit, but before we do uh, talk about this relative, I want to read a little story about Bacon as kind of a rent boy you got to imagine uh, uh you got to imagine francis as um it's almost like a a, a gay male breakfast at tiffany's in london in well, the 20s not not, mu not long before this we had Os oscar wilde was mm -hmm. taking advantage of the services of of boys like this right at the peak of his success mm, it's so. like midnight cowboy 1926 yeah so. yeah interesting well, I'm going to read from, from Francis. Uh, I can't say I was what's called moral when I was young. Uh, morality is a luxury that has come on me with age. I think I just did whatever I could to get by. I'd always stolen money from my father whenever I could. And when I got to London, I'd often take a room and not bother to stay and pay the rent. And then, although my parents had always told me that I was ugly, I found that some people were attracted to me and thought that I was pretty at that age. So I decided to do everything to get people to take a fancy to me, and I didn't very much care what happened after that. I remember once when I was absolutely broke, I got myself picked up by a man in Dover Street. He was Greek, but he'd been living in London for a long time, and he was obviously a rich man. Well, after we had been in his bedroom, he went out into the bathroom, and I started going through his pockets. He must have been watching me in the mirror because suddenly he came out and said, what are you doing, Francis? And I said, well, you know what I'm doing. Then he said, you don't have to do that. Just ask. And he took me down to a bank and drew out 100 pounds, which was a very large sum then, and gave it to me. It was a marvelous way, marvelous way to behave, and I've never forgotten it. <laughs> That's, wow. He gave him more than half the average yeah, uh, I was gonna say it's like a six month salary six months wage. Right? Yeah, it'd be yeah. like probably be like twenty five or thirty thousand dollars for wow. for services rendered. Yeah, wow. yeah. So, he, you know, he was a bit. He was maybe like a little bit of a sugar baby there. He was. Mm -hmm. He was. He was getting the work in. He was putting it in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so now uh, we're gonna get back to that relative of Winnie Harcourt Smith. Uh Bacon claimed his father had asked this uncle to take him in hand and make a man of him. Uh, now you so said now, uncle in quotes. He's not really an uncle. Right. He's a guy. He's right. A, okay. Yeah. I don't think he's, I don't think he's a blood uncle. Right. But so now he's it's given sort of in that like English aristocratic way where it's like everyone is vaguely someone's uncle or aunt kind of thing. Second cousin and uncle at the same kind time right <laughs> right well yeah. so uh, um this is what happens uh let me see uh one moment here ah 
I want to read a little more about the period and, and homosexuality. I'm going to read a couple paragraphs here. This is too good. Um, uh, and, uh, but let me just see, because I've got to make sure that I get, there's such an interesting story. Hang on one second. Uh, because what ends up happening is, yeah, in any case, London's homosexuals were both numerous, not least because of the English public school system, and fiercely repressed. They were thought repressed. They were thought of when they were thought of at all as generically effeminate, Nancy boys or pansies in the current slang. With the effeminacy, uh, effeminacy, there was often a uh, there often went a love of the arts and a generally advanced taste in all matters of style. The coterie of esthetes and flamboyant homosexuals that grew up at Oxford in the early 1920s around Harold Acton and Brian Howard had begun to influence both artistic and moral attitudes. But age-old prejudices were not easily changed. When King George V was told that someone he knew quite well was a homosexual, he replied with evident bewilderment. I thought that men like that shot themselves. Whatever form it took, homosexuality remained a criminal offense, which was severely punished. As Francis drifted through London's homosexual underworld with its special glances and meeting places, its codes and clubs, his father decided to make one last attempt to stop his son from going completely to the bad. Amongst his few friends, there was a relative on his wife's side called Harcourt Smith, renowned for his manliness, was about to leave on a trip to Berlin. So uh, an uncle by marriage. Okay. Why not entrust Francis to this man's man, Eddie Bacon reasoned, and see if he couldn't straighten the boy out? With little warning, Francis found himself plucked out of the back streets of Soho and his routine of odd jobs, petty theft and rent dodging, and en route with his upstanding uncle to Berlin. Hmm. So very suddenly... Uh, he is, uh, he's in Berlin during the, um, <laughs> uh, during that period, which of course is really quite, quite famous with all the cabarets and the, the sort of open sexuality. Um, uh, WH Auden described it in 1929 this way. Berlin is the buggers daydream. There are 170 <laughs> male brothels under police control. What? <laughs> wow okay so uh, so this period was very brief uh you know he um he was only in berlin for a very short while uh and this this uncle and i think it might be in the book that i'm getting out right now this is the revelations book mm. this uncle francis basically said would fuck anything that moved. Oh God. <laughs> Including Francis. Oh geez. So yeah. Best laid plans of mice and men. Uh dad sends Francis to the homosexual capital of the world at the time. Uh yeah. So let me this see. This reminds here. me of a guy I knew back in my college days who we said he's not gay exactly. He just has no standards. <laughs> right he's right. not really a predilection he's just, he's just really anything. horny there's yeah. no uh, yeah no preferences no taste just anything yeah yeah it's it's unfortunate because there was i i don't know if i'll be able to find it i don't know if i got the page number down but it was francis essentially says it did not take long for us to end up in bed together oh, man. um and the business would come to an end in in a pretty short period of time because the the man whose name i think was cecil cecil met a woman and oh. ended up not being and just sort of moving along to this woman. So in a funny, well, I'm going to read this. This yeah. is from the the massive uh, Francis Francis Bacon Revelations book. Um, Bacon enjoyed observing in later years to Lucian Freud, among others, that his father sold him to Harcourt Smith as if he were a prize colt. You know, my father and my mother were disgusted with me when I was 16, as I was a pederast. So my father offered me to his friend. He said. Then he fell in love with me and took me to Berlin. Bacon was was being wryly disingenuous. His mother certainly did not consider him a pederast, nor was she disgusted with him, and his father neither sold nor offered him. But Bacon's sardonic aside contained, as usual, a measure of truth. Harcourt Smith was leading a dissolute, unsettled, and possibly hard-pressed life, having left his Ormond Gate house in 1925, and Bacon's parents probably bought or subsidized the trip. 
the major would never have handed over a significant sum to Francis. He would have instead delivered the funds to the older and more responsible Harcourt Smith, leading Francis to feel that he was sold. The more important implication of sold was unmistakable. A father selling his son for the sexual use of another man. There could hardly be a more cold-blooded transaction. Oof. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah, so we could go on uh, uh, on and on. We're already into hour two here. Um, he was I noticed too... something, sorry, I noticed something mm-hmm. earlier on you read it, quote, and I don't remember what book it was from, but it sounded like, from what you were saying, that the, the public school was like, uh, cranking out homosexual boys like as uh, so it, it almost sounded like the system tended to do that i don't know i don't know very if that's... very famously so really? uh yeah. yeah i mean, I mean if it... you want to get like if you want to get like spooky with it it's sort of like you can kind of see it as like a form of like ritual abuse because it's like mm-hmm. the public schooling you know the upper crust like sort of bourgeois aristocrat kind of of the english establishment and they sort of do this thing to reinforce i guess the social control and so yeah it's like a hot house of like there's like a book about it called by jason horsley called the vice of kings which oh. is like all about the sort of like ritualized abuse and like certain circles in uh britain my god well, and you, okay. you have to understand too these are these are boarding schools right, uh, right and if you don't think that like in boarding schools in america these teenagers are like flip it flicking the bean and like oh sure. you know getting yeah. down like yeah it's i've talked it's to it's, it's one thing with it's, with the boys uh, in each other uh, yeah i just kind of want to try to understand this a little bit better that's interesting sure it's it's a pretty it, it's just common knowledge it's almost yeah. a the butt of a joke almost it's like mm-hmm. a cliche right mm-hmm. you, you know you're gonna paddle paddle the other boy you know uh at, at at you know it's almost like a yeah anyway yeah um okay Well, so one of our uh, friends in the Art of Darkness Telegram chat, which you can find through artofdarkpod.com, join us. We've got a little active little Telegram community growing there, Um, asked about this period and whether or not uh, Bacon had been much influenced by images he had seen. Of course, of course, you have to understand we haven't even Bacon hasn't even begun to paint. He hasn't even really begun to think about painting. Um, one thing I skipped over in the, in the childhood is there was a period where he was living with some relatives, some wealthier relatives who had had an estate. I think it was in England um, where the the grandfather of the current lords of the manor had been a fairly renowned painter mm. um, in a style that Francis would have abhorred, of course, as he as he matured. But in this sort of older style, and they they had an like an entire floor of the house was devoted to painting Hmm. so he didn't come from like an intellectual slum he grew up around some of this business and that would have made an impression on him too he definitely cultivated though an image of somebody who came out of the wilderness wilderness yeah yeah he's a self-made genius and even the way he would describe his his work of painting this impulsiveness he would he would claim that the the best of his paintings emerged unplanned Mm -hmm. um which mm-hmm. is also kind of not entirely true. Uh, although sometimes he would evoke things that would be accidental. There's a very famous painting, 1946, just called Painting, which I think he he started as like a raven in a field or something, and it evolves into something totally different, which we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to read, read a little bit about this German period. What might have intrigued Bacon in London as its collar loosened after the war was on full display in unbuttoned Berlin. The city appeared to be the most modern in Europe, or to put it differently, Berlin was leaving the old world behind with the most conviction. For a homosexual of Bacon's disposition, Berlin represented another kind of home, a modern stage where the new truth was unmasked. By way of education, he later said, I found myself in the atmosphere of the Blue Angel, the great uh, Josef von Stanberg film in one of the great decadent years of Berlin. Until the founding of the Weimar Republic in 1918, Germany had been as reactionary as England, but the defeat and horror of the war seemed momentarily to silence that earnest Germany. Thomas Mann's 
The Magic Mountain was published in 1924. Bertolt Recht and Kurt Weill soon launched their serrated satire, The Three Penny Opera. Otto Dix painted a society that appeared irredeemably corrupt. His massive metropolis triptych depicted a Berlin in which the moneyed cafe society of the city presented in the central panel was flanked by scenes of cripples and prostitutes. It was a nightmarish juxtaposition of the oblivious rich with a sordid underclass. Uh, at the age of 17, Bacon would not have regarded the city in analytical or abstract terms, but Berlin permeated his sensibility, providing a perspective that seemed to him more or less right. So this had a big um, impact on him. Um, he would go on to say that, uh, uh, you know, he really wasn't influenced by uh, by German painters um, that much. But then again, he was very, very stingy with his praise he really there are a few painters that he really claimed to admire the the person who he would go on to see in paris picasso is the reason he determined to paint mm -hmm. um he was also heavily influenced by a photographer named mybridge who did these um uh this this photography where he would he would take very rapid pictures of say an elephant in motion mm -hmm. almost like film and he would lay them out and display them. And, and Bacon Bacon referred to, to photography an awful lot. When he was doing his portraiture or when he was even drawing fig figures from models who, who he had posed for him, he had a man named, um, I think it was Walter Deacon, Deacon, to take um, his photographs. He would never sit with the subject in the room. He would, he would work from a photograph. Um, huh. Yeah, for what it's worth. There are a couple yeah. of other interesting facts about the way he would paint, which um, I might as well throw in now. He would, he eventually started painting on the back of uh, of his canvases because at one point he was so poor. I think he was in maybe in Monaco. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes get Monaco and Morocco conflated, but anyway, he was traveling. He was so poor he couldn't even buy like enough canvases. canvases to work, and he found that that working on the back of the canvases gave him more like catch. It was like grittier. So yeah. all of his work was on the back of a, of a given canvas. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then he would, he would have his paintings presented always under glass. So there would be like a, like reflections and sort of strain. It would affect the, the look of the painting. So there's just a few hmm. fun facts about him. Um, yeah. So He's in Berlin. He's getting a little taste of like the BDSM scene of what's going on. He would see Metropolis. Um, he would see, you know, uh, Battleship Potemkin here around this period. And still he's not painting. Um, so I want to keep moving on hmm. uh, in the interest of time. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So in 1927, he's in Berlin. That's where he first saw Metropolis and Battleship Potemkin, uh, both, you know, later influences on his work. Uh, he spent only two months in Berlin. <laughs> Harcourt Smith, this this uncle, left after one. Um, quoting Bacon, he soon got tired of me, of course, and went off with a woman. I didn't really know what to do, so I hung on for a while. Bacon then spent the next year and a half in Paris. This is where he met a woman named Yvonne Bakenten. She was a pianist and a sort of a connoisseur of the arts. He met her at the opening of an exhibition. She was 10 years his senior. He wanted to learn French, and he would he would eventually learn French. And you could find in a lot of the documentaries it's him speaking this kind of drunken <laughs> Anglo French enough. I mean, he, he knew he knew how to get his point across. Mm -hmm. um, he lived with this woman, Madame Bakenton, um, and her family in their house near Chantilly, and he traveled to Paris to visit the art galleries. Um, and at the Chateau, he saw Nicholas Posin's Massacre of the Innocents, a painting which he often mm. referred to in his later work. So he's he's not painting. I don't think he's even conceived of becoming a painter quite yet, but he's still ga he's gathering these influences, influences he's mm. hungry. Almost the way, you know, you could think of it in terms of his masochism. He's just being struck by images, going out of his way to consume art enjoying these big cosmopolitan centers and sort of setting himself up to become a, a, an urban creature, having been shuttled around to various relatively, um, you know, rural areas, although with time in London. And I imagine he probably figured out pretty quickly, like, hey, I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm going to have a much better time if I land in one of these big cities where, uh, you know, people like me are 
you know, exist and are, if not in the open, at least we're like, you know, you know, we have our, our like mind. There's people. a tribe. Yeah, there's a tribe you can, you can attach yourself to of some kind. Yeah. That makes sense. hundred yeah. percent. Um, I was just so, looking yeah. up a uh, massacre of the innocents and mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, in some ways uh, it's a fairly traditional, well, hold on. I may not be looking at the right one. I'm looking at one by Rubens apparently. Well, that's fine. Well, will you yeah. do that? You know, I want to talk about the battleship Potemkin. So, um, he was captivated by Eisenstein's battleship Potemkin, a masterpiece disguised as propaganda. He might've first seen it in Berlin. Um, The film was initially banned by Germany's censorship board because of its leftist politics, but a shortened version was released in Berlin and it was in sensation. Um, And if you don't know this film, you should watch it. The indelible image of the nurse caught in the massacre on the Odessa steps, her pince nez bloodily shattering as she opens her mouth in a scream would haunt him for the rest of his life. Uh, Battleship Potemkin without question helped spark Bacon into life as an artist. I just think that's that's so um, fascinating because like his work is so uh, dramatic mm-hmm. and and he he would become famous or his first breakthrough anyway was for this triptych, which has all of this. Dr- there's like this implied drama and it almost it's almost a it's a religious form to do it sort of mm-hmm. evokes religiosity you think about triptychs at the altar and everything mm-hmm. i just think that the fact that something from a film impacted him that much is very telling yeah um, absolutely yeah. like what's striking about uh francis bacon's paintings is that it's like a synthesis of primal almost like primordial and like ultra i mean ultra modern like he really is like he's regarded as the greatest 20th century painter because he was like the first painter truly of the 20th century influenced by film and interested in influenced by photography and like by like the triptychs, like it's like an earlier sort of religious form of painting, but also it has like, it's reminiscent of a film strip. So yeah, he's like the sort of like art equivalent of like, I don't know, like archeo futurism, and this whole Berlin period is like a it's like a transformative time because like Berlin really kind of that time period. I can't help but think of it as like the first like cyberpunk city. And like that's <laughs> why, you know, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, it wasn't so much a depiction of the future, but like a depiction of the present through the prism of the future, because you had like, you know, this ancient european city but you had like the human debris of this extremely like industrialized warfare like people with like body parts missing and then you had movie theaters and like cabarets and all that sort of cd stuff and so yeah this is really the crucible where the bacon really sizzled (laughs) love it yes love it yeah 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 I want to I want to read a little bit more about Harcourt Smith the uncle uh he appeared and so this is we're in this Berlin period he appeared in public to be wealthy and a well-dressed gentleman in private however he destroyed all manners becoming a kind of sexual monster even Bacon could never quite bring himself to describe the details of what happened but he left no doubt about its violent character um wow later in life Bacon would often mix pain and pleasure It therefore meant something when he judged Harcourt Smith of all the men he had known the most vicious. John Richardson called him a real ultra sadistic sadist. And he took Francis to Berlin where it was kinky heaven and used to thrash Francis and sort of broke him in. Harcourt Smith did not appear homosexual, a quality Bacon found attractive. In fact, he was bisexual. He was a brute, Bacon said, who fucked absolutely anything. A picture of Bacon taken in Berlin attests to his almost feminine beauty and allure so delicate that the radical German photographer Helmar Lersky actually stopped him on the street to ask if the 17-year-old might sit for him. Bacon was initially concerned that Lersky was proposing an assassination, but finally agreed. So, um, yeah, there's a photograph. Oh, God, just the, 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 the happenstance of being handed off to this Harcourt Smith guy. Oh, yeah, he's a he's a handsome 
handsome yeah, young man. A, there's a yeah. photo of Bacon at a very young age. Yeah. Uh, you can find this. It's a, uh, taken by experimental photographer Helmar Lersky, L-E-R-S-K-I. Yeah. So um, just and, and one more little fine, final anecdote. When, when Francis told his father, hey, I want to go to Paris to learn French, his father said, Forget it. You speak English, and that's good enough for everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of that's the kind of man that his father was. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and and uh, Jacob, thanks for that. That I think that was a very cool description of Berlin during that period. Like that's one of those. Thanks. Yeah, that's one of those moments in time when people go. If you had a time machine, it's like, oh man, Berlin yeah. in the twenties. Just what was that like? I. I right. I wonder. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he, he spent a little bit of time in London, then he spent a little bit of time in uh, uh, Berlin, and then he spent a year and a half in Paris. So I want to talk a little bit about this time in Paris um, before we're going to take him back to London and his and his career as a painter. Um, let's see. And so he's just, I mean, this time where he's, say, in Paris, I mean, he's cobbling together a living... I understand in Berlin, he's getting money from this Harcourt Smith guy, but in Paris, it'd be it just catch as catch can. I, I think he's still getting that three pounds a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah. But then he's also, he's rooming with this family. So that right. probably saved him a little bit of money. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not like he has his own place or his own flat. Man. Um, so, uh, yeah. So let's see here. Um, I want to read about some of the, some of the Paris time. Yeah. Even at 17, Bacon's hunger for images was omnivorous. He did not particularly distinguish among photos, paintings, films, newspapers, and the kaleidoscopic flux of the street, but he was becoming more and more aware of painting. It was probably Madame Balkenton who took him to the Musée Conda, filled with French and Italian art and located in the vast and ornate Chateau de Chantilly near her house. This is where he found uh, the Massacre of the Innocents by Poussin, which is uh, P-O-U-S-S-I-N. Um, a mother flings up her arms to prevent, prevent one of King Herod's soldiers from putting her squirming son to the sword. Her mouth is torn open in a scream placed in the center of the painting. That becomes particularly shocking, giving the formal face of the composition. Perhaps uh, they went to see Battleship Potemkin together. So he's, you know, he's already drawn to these extraordinary sort of dark um, mm -hmm. images. Uh, now let's get to the bit about Picasso. Right. Let's see here. One moment. Yeah, Picasso. Bacon said, left him stunned. This is huge because we're, you, you really do have in, by many estimations in Picasso, who we will eventually do on art of darkness, art of dark pod.com, uh, patreon.com slash art of dark pod. Uh, we will eventually do Picasso and he's mm -hmm. pretty widely regarded as the most important painter of the first half of the 20th century. And many people say that Bacon is the most important of the second half. Right. Um, so the shock of liberation of seeing a new figure bursting free, arms flung out from 19th century closets, changed his understanding of the world. This new figure did not live in a plush, old-fashioned room. Bacon underwent a second innocence, he said, as if the world had been made new or newly ancient, and he passed through profound experiences to a neo-paganism. He was still too young and inexperienced to know what to do with such experiences, but the desire to tell the truth can become for certain young people a kind of addiction or an infection that can, can be treated but not cured. Um, he would deny taking art classes, but some people think that he may have taken a few sort of formal art classes while he was in Paris. Um Oh, you kind of mess up the brand, though, man. Yeah, right, right, right. You know um, what I mean, like you're presenting yourself as an outsider. I get it. Yeah. Well, so he he did become passable, um, you know, in French, and I think that that line about neo paganism, Jacob, reminds me of what you had you had been saying. He he marries this kind of ultra postmodern sensibility with this kind of primitivism in a way that nobody else really 
really had before him. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I'm reminded of Blue Velvet. Uh, I don't think you get Blue Velvet without, I don't know. Blue Velvet reminds me of Francis Bacon quite a lot. The the great David oh, Lynch movie. Yeah. 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 Blue yeah. Velvet and also like Dario Argento in a lot of ways. Like Suspiria is very much that sort of like, you know, ancient kind of feeling, but like in like, you know, modern post-war uh, Europe as well. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Interest interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Very interesting. He he ended up living in Montparnasse. Um, you know, during a period during the period where Joyce would have been there, Hemingway would have been there, Picasso. Um, but he was so young <laughs> at the time. Um, yeah, he was a he was a boy compared was, to all these people. Yeah, yeah. A, a teen. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna end up meeting. Uh, don't worry, we're we're maybe about halfway through, maybe not quite halfway through okay. the episode here, and uh, okay. we're just. Okay. I feel like we're just getting started. He hasn't even really laid brush to canvas yet, so buckle up. Uh, but eventually, we're gonna have appearances <laughs> by uh, William Burroughs is gonna show up. Ginsburg's ah, gonna show okay, up. Great. Tennessee Williams is gonna show ah. up. Yeah, so we're we're crossing the streams huh. here. So yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I'm going to put us in time. So it's the winter of 1928. He moved back to London uh, to work as an interior designer. And later, hmm. and he he uh, kind of would occlude this period. He was not, he didn't talk about this an awful lot later um, in life after he'd become a painter and quite famous. Um, uh, he would attack abstract art. Uh, you know, art that was not figurative, not drawing the human form or not drawing forms, he would say it can never be anything but decorative. That was his big insult. And when you hmm. when you think about it, he's not wrong. Like think about one of those canvases that's just a slash through the canvas. You go, is yeah. it art or is it decoration? What hmm. what do you know? So yeah, I suppose not, it yeah. ultimately is how do you define either of those? But yeah, I, I do see yeah. I do see this point. Yeah. Well, so in, in, I think to his thinking, because he did design and he did decor, in his his mind, he moved past that and elevated himself into fine art. And right. I think when he would look at something like um uh a Pollock, he would go, This yeah. is just this is just decor. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh he was he he was pretty uh, severe about it. Um, and, hmm. and some of the, some of his interviews are very, very funny. And he, he kind of won me over with it too. Uh, I'm, I'm a little yeah, bit like, and yeah, well, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be making friends in his generation by saying that though at all. Well, exactly. Especially not yeah. among the Americans. Um, yeah. but Francis had enough friends. Uh, Francis <laughs> was the, the bell of the ball and we're getting into the period where he, before he even really made his name as a painter, there were already rumblings of, a painter named Francis Bacon. He was a, hmm. a serious socialite. Um, he was to become a fixture at a place called the Colony in Soho, um, which a woman named Muriel Belcher uh, ran and operated for decades. And uh, hmm. this is a this happens a little later. I don't. We're getting a little out of order, but in the forties, I after the war, I think might well. I'll get to it when I get to it, but um, we'll get to that. Okay, so. He moves to South Kensington, which is a very Tony part of London. Um, He rented a studio, shared the upper floor with a man named Eric Alden, his first collector, and his childhood nanny, Jesse Lightfoot. Hmm. So the the nanny's coming along. Uh, Hmm. In 1929, he met Eric Hall, his patron and lover in an often torturous and abusive relationship. All of his serious relationships, except for, I think, one of the ones toward the end um, were abusive and violent with mm. just with, it was just a fixture of his. Well, it sounds like that's romantic he life. Would, he would want it and he yeah. wouldn't have had it any other way really. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he left that studio in 1931 and settled uh, into, a, and he had no settled space for years. Um, he may have shared a studio with Roy de Maestra in 31, 32 in Chelsea. Mm. Um, and he, uh, God, that's hard as a painter. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You're sharing a studio. You don't have yeah, your own yeah. space. Yep. You're transient. Exactly. Um, and his canvases were not small. Like if you see some, these are some pretty big canvases uh, later. So 
he would do he was doing the interior design at, at the time. And uh, I want to read a little bit from Revelations here now about his character, just to give you a general idea. And and we're coming to the period now where he begins to paint. But this is from the prologue of um, of uh, Revelations. Let me find it. Um, because this is, to my mind, this is the period where Francis becomes Francis. He's crystallized whatever happened in his childhood. The rift has been, has been made with his father and his family. He's been out on his own now for long enough to kind of sort of come into his own. He found Berlin. He found Paris. He's lived on his own for a year and a half. He speaks French now, and now he's he's in England, and he's making a career as an interior um as like a designer of interiors, so he would, you know, so, um, and I think we have to remember too, that in, in this period, a hundred years ago, they matured a bit faster than, than we tend oh, to true. now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He didn't, uh, he didn't go off to college. He started like living, right. uh, right. even right with a little bat. bit of a trust fund, you know, he, he was, he was in it. it. That trust fund was not enough to like, didn't cover every bill. Um, well, and yeah, if you like yeah. good food and good wine and going to mu- the museum and all these kinds of things, yeah, it's certainly not going to cover the, cut the mustard. Yeah, that's sense. it. Yeah, you made yeah. a point I wanted to make. So that's great. So this is a little bit about his character. Friends sometimes uh, notice Bacon's tick. He would reach for his collar if a situation suddenly became difficult or the right word eluded him. A tug or two gave him a moment's res- respite. He might even shoot his cuffs. The tick was poignant less because it revealed a crack in the persona than because it suggested just how difficult it was for him to sustain the performance. He had many debilitating weaknesses. To keep going, he required extensive medical care, including drugs for both his physical problems, asthma and related illnesses, and his unremitting tension. He also required work to steady his day. As early as 1932, when he was 22 years old, he was glad for work so that the mind could lose its preoccupations. And he required alcohol to relieve the pressure of the night. All three, alcohol, work, and drugs could serve as intoxicants to elevate his mood, but they also paradoxically made it possible to imagine a more conventional life. It was Bacon's secret that he was not just a radical master of the 20th century stage who exulted in the dark arts. He was simultaneously an Englishman suffused with longing for the ordinary patterns of joy and solace denied him as a child and young man. Yeah. Hmm. Just a little bit of a vision of, of, of how Bacon was, I think is very interesting. Um, And he, but he would go on to just be an absolute um, rake and, uh, Hmm. Also, like a terror, he would terrorize people, um, depending on the <laughs> mood that he was in. And we're going to get some of those anecdotes here coming up. And don't forget, on the After Dark Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod, we're going to talk about which dictator uh, he wanted to be uh, who sodomized we want, by. We wanted yeah. to take dictation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So that's going to be uh, an awful lot of fun. Okay, so let's let's get him moving into um, his actual work. Okay, so we have. By 1933, he's painting. And this is one of the early paintings that we have. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna bother looking at it um on this pod, but you can look it up. It's called Crucifixion. Um the 1933 Crucifixion was his first painting to attract public attention and was in part based on Picasso's The Three Dancers from 1925. It was not well received. Disillusioned, he abandoned painting for nearly a decade. And suppressed his earlier works. So if you look at a timeline of Bacon, we've got like two or three paintings, three or four paintings from the 30s. And then nothing until he breaks out with um, with the big painting that that we're going to come to, the big triptych that we're going to come to. Touchy, um, touchy. Just, yeah, yeah. Well, he, listen, Francis Bacon was a bitch. <laughs> he was a bitch, but I love him for it. he was he was not queenie. He was a little effete. He okay. didn't like twinks. He didn't like the queenie, swishy, okay. uh, gay thing. He liked guys that you couldn't quite tell. Um, mm. He liked masculine men. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. There was a there, there's a story later when he was pretty well known, and there was some sort of dinner party, and they sat like a hot young thing next to him, thinking that. 
it would like yeah. please him and he just ignored him the entire night and like ended up talking with like one of the waiters or something. You know, do you know what I mean? Like he, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, he definitely was a shapeshifter in terms of class. I mean, yeah. later in his life, he would have he'd have lunch with the Sainsburys, who would be like they'd be like the Rockefellers. Mm-hmm. Um, he'd have lunch with them. They were like his some of his biggest collectors, and then go, you know, get beaten and railed by a semi literate dude from the East End of London. Oh man! I, it, uh, I mean, yeah. It, I, I, I frankly, I admire him for it. I think it's, I think it's tremendous. Um, yeah, yeah. Huh. Very yeah, that's, interesting. That's character. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. He's he's like many of our other subjects that we've done, but I, there's nobody quite like Francis Bacon. There's no, there, there really isn't. I've I've had a lot of fun learning about him and kind of getting into his head a little bit. Um, he visited Paris in 1935, where he bought a secondhand book on anatomical diseases of the mouth containing high quality hand colored plates of both open mouths and oral interiors, which haunted and obsessed him for the remainder of his life. Uh, they're talking a bit about the um, the Potemkin. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> In the in the I know right in the winter I just of, imagined some of the the images that are in this book. It's got oh be, yeah oh. yeah. You think about like Marilyn Manson in the in the nineties had that mouth kind of weird mouth fetish, and there's a weird open mouths, and there is something. I, I think about Goya and that that Saturn devouring his his children. There is something about mouths. It's a, it's a little hmm, I don't know I don't know what it. I'm sure there's some Freudian or like pseudo Freudian explanation for it, but. Um, in the winter of 35 and 36, uh, he was chosen. Um, well, he, uh, the guys were coming around to look for the uh, selection for the International Surrealist Exhibition. They visited his studio. They saw three or four large canvases, including one with a grandfather clock. But they said his work was insufficiently surreal to be included in the show. Um Bacon claimed that Penrose told him, one of the men told him, Mr. Bacon, don't you realize a lot has happened in painting since the Impressionists? Uh, so he's he's going through his like, mm, they don't get me. Um, in 1936 or seven, he moved uh, to Chelsea and he's still moving around a little bit. Um, so let's see here. He, he he claimed his artistic career was delayed because he spent too long looking for a subject matter that could sustain his interest. So hmm. this is he was very very particular. He destroyed as many or more canvases than ever saw the light of day. Uh, uh, really? He yeah. destroyed a lot of canvases, and after he had achieved renown, uh, people would lurk outside his studio looking for scraps scraps um (laughs) he hired he hired a fellow to take the the paintings cut up the paintings and then take them immediately to uh to be incinerated and they would have to hand the guy like a a couple of pounds to watch him incinerate the paintings um uh so yeah and i might as well tell it there's a story later when his paintings were already selling for a great sum of money where he had i think he was in he was in tangier he was somewhere not in london and he meant to throw out a canvas he ended up seeing the canvas in a gallery years later oh my god (laughs) how much how much do you want for this Fifty thousand pounds he cut them a check and took it outside and destroyed it whoa okay yeah yeah he's for yeah. real he's yeah. for real he yeah. does not you know and that's yeah. of course at, at the point where you know he's um rich. yeah but, yeah but i mean he yeah. yeah still that's not a that's not a small thing to do that's how much he cared about the 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 visceral this painting works mm-hmm. um some hmm. of his more fa- famous paintings which we're going to come to soon are the the series of the popes which you yeah. may have seen, and mm-hmm. he he grew to to really dislike them. He thought that he huh. could have done could have done better, but they're considered just masterpieces of of uh, of the period. Um, sure. Well, so in any event, um, in any event, we're going to keep moving along here. Um, in January of thirty seven, uh, at Thomas Agnew and Sons uh, on Old Bond Street in London, he exhibited uh, in a group show young British painters. Um, that included Graham Sutherland and Roy de Maestra. They were all pals. Um, Eric Hall organized the show. He showed four works, figures in a garden, abstraction, abstraction from the human form, 
known from magazine photographs, and Seated Figure, which was lost. lost. Hmm. These paintings prefigure three studies for the figures at the base of a crucifixion. In mm -hmm. alter alternatively representing a tripod structure, bared teeth, and both being biomorphic in form. Now, we're going to come to three figures very soon. We're heading up to the war. We're getting into the into wartime here. Um, Jacob, what was the first Bacon painting you you encountered in the wild? Are you, are you, are you familiar with his work from museums or... Uh, yeah, actually, the first one and actually the only one I've seen in the wild is that three studies of uh, Lucian Freud painting that sold for like an insane amount of money. Forty six like million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and because it was like after it was sold and there was like all this sort of like rumor and speculation because it was like a private buyer or like they didn't disclose who it was. And then for some reason the person who bought it, who turned out to be the ex-wife of Steve Wynn, the Las oh. Vegas resort mogul. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, or she rather, uh, like exclusively uh, had it available for viewing at the Portland Art Museum. So like one day, I think I was on a lunch break. My mom and I went to see it and it was very impressive. And like, I always like whenever I go to art museums, I like to get up as close as I can without alerting the uh, guard <laughs> there and like sort of see all the brush strokes. And yeah, you can definitely tell that like he was like, like the sort of like sadomasochism and violence of his personal and sexual life definitely extends to his painting style. And like, cause like you could see just like the just flurry of, brush strokes and you get up close to it and and like in a similar way just listening to you talk about how he would like destroy as many paintings as he would put out publicly it's sort of i feel like that's a through line with his sadomasochism because yes. his mindset is kind of like you know if like the painting is strong enough to withstand my sort of bullying and like uh sadomasochism then it deserves to be out but if it if it gets broken in then it deserves to be tossed in the dumpster wow yeah interesting 100 uh, percent. yeah we can we can and we are going to start looking at paintings here now soon but nothing is like seeing them in person uh i remember when i first saw um the three studies at the tate modern uh just being bowled over and i i was and remain a, a Philistine in so many ways. I had no idea who Francis Bacon was. I didn't know that I was supposed to react mm -hmm. in any particular way. I had no clue. And I stopped and I could not look away. It was like when I first saw there's a Rembrandt here at the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art, one of the two Lucretia paintings. And I, I was so overwhelmed by it. And then you pause and then you look over and you go, oh, it's Rembrandt. Like, yeah. And that, you know, you, you come without any bias and then you have this overwhelming response and you go, oh, this is an extraordinarily important, important painting. Nobody had to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And, and that I like to do that. I, I, I do like to hold on to a certain amount of naivete um, because well, you come yeah, to, it's, it's easy to become yeah. cynical otherwise. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Oh, sure. this is this is overrated or whatever. Anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing that, um, Jacob. Where where was that? Where did you see that? That and and that painting was the um, ha, the best selling or the high, it, it went for the highest amount of money for a year and a half, and then Picasso actually a Picasso sold for like one hundred and seventy million, and who knows what it is now. But yeah, that was the the most valuable painting ever sold for like a year and a half. Yeah, I saw it was at the Portland Art Museum. I don't know why. Oh, it must have been on loan from MoMA or something. Well, it would no because it was weird because this was like right after it sold. So I don't know if mm. like the like Elaine Wynn or whoever, like if she had some connection to the Portland Art Museum or like right. what was going on. But yeah, it was mm. like, yeah, it was an, a sort of like event showing because it was like the first time it had been like wow. put out uh since it was bought for that. How would you how would you like to be the people involved in? 
ensuring that the painting is transported properly. Yeah. I mean, oh my gosh! No, that that whole world is fascinating. Here in the Detroit area, I, I know there's a there's a house um, that's in the family of the of the it's in the Ford family, right? The Fords are a big deal around here, and I, I knew a guy who knew a guy whose job was to just be in the house because part of the insurance on the artwork is there always had to be someone around. So his job, he would just hang out like he didn't do anything. He his, he was a warm body for insurance purposes because of this art, art collection. He wasn't even really a security guard. They had other security patrolling the premises. It's just fascinating what goes into this. I'm actually looking at this painting on the Christie's website, the auction website. And yeah, it says price realized $142,405,000. And then there's a little link here that says estimate on request. Which I don't know if that's if I'm interested in buying it. I'm able to. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Know. Let's see how uh, <laughs> how crypto does. Um, yeah, just absolutely insane. Now, yeah. of course, those numbers at this point, Francis is still living hand to mouth, uh, even with a little bit of. I mean, you know, he's doing his design work, and but he's not. He doesn't have a, a place of his own yet. So we're talking about coming from the bottom. And, and going all the way to the damn top in the next in the next uh, 20 years or so. So, all right, let's keep on keeping on. Um, so it's 1940, uh, his father dies. So Bacon is named the sole trustee and executor of his father's will. Uh, the will requested the funeral be as private and, and simple as possible. Now, we're, we're at the point of the war. So what is Francis Bacon doing the war? Well, he's unfit for active service because of his, his asthma and probably his other his sort of disposition and whatever. You know, he's he's not going to end up, uh, you know, in the, on the, in the front lines, uh, you know, shooting at Krauts. Right? It's just not it's not going to work. Um, so he volunteered uh, for civil defense work and worked full time in the air raid precautions rescue service. Hmm. Um. The fine dust of bombed London worsened his asthma and he was discharged. Now, that said, he did spend time. I don't have a reading per se of this, but I he did spend time tr trying to help rescue people from the rubble of bombed out, blitzed out London. So, wow. yeah. So let's throw that onto the pile of his experience uh, and think about how that calls back to the period in Ireland and now he's seeing London. Yeah. Get and you know, interestingly, bombed. you'd think of him as being uh, not a, pa not a patriotic streak or even, uh, even a compassionate streak in him, even mm. to some degree. Like I well, can see him just sort of being like, Oh, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that you almost had no choice, but to care. I mean, this was existential in a way that Americans really have never quite known. Well, yeah, that's like true. they that's to, were, you know, they were bombing, they were bombing London. You're an able bodied man to a degree. What are you yeah. going to do? And, right. and that point you made, you're, you're getting at a contradiction of his character, which people would comment on. Um, this fellow, uh, Daniel Farson in the Gilded Gutter Life book. And that title comes from a postcard that, that Francis uh, wrote to him, something about living a gilded gutter life, which I think is such a great phrase. Francis was smart as hell. That's another thing. <laughs> Watch some interviews with this guy. He was sharp. He may not have been formally educated, but he mean he he could he could weave a sentence together for sure. He had a, I believe it. a poet's soul. Um, but uh, what was I? What was I talking about? He's in London, and oh yes, no, he he could do incredibly cruel things. Cut people out. He would he would cut down young artists sometimes who would kind of come to him looking for, depending on whether he liked the cut of their jib, he could be very warm or very cool, but he would also be somebody who would quietly like pay the hospital bills for a friend um, when he had more money. He, you know, he, I think there was a woman who he knew from the colony, from the, the club, which is just a bar, right? They have these still there. They're clubs, right? You pay like an annual membership. You can get your friends in. Uh, it's just a way to keep the hoi polloi out, right? Um, in London. Uh, and, um, you know, he paid to move one of his friends to a better hospital. Um, so he had a sweet side. He wasn't, a, he wasn't like a monster. Um, he was monstrous, but he wasn't a monster. Um, I think that's important to, to get over. Um, 
Well, so any in any case, um, at the height of the Blitz, Eric Hall, uh, his friend, rented a cottage for Bacon and himself at Bedal's Lodge in Steep near Petersfield, Hampshire. Uh, figure getting out of a car was painted here, but is known only from an early photograph. Uh, da da da. Yeah, so this is another ancestor for the big painting we're coming to. The composition was suggested by a photograph of Hitler getting out of a car at one of the Nuremberg rallies. Bacon claimed to have copied the car and not much else. Um, I think Hall was one of his lovers. I think that was the fellow we were talking about um, earlier where he had the kind of the, there was some, yeah, yeah, his patron and lover. So let's see here. We're coming to the paintings, I promise. <laughs> um, they moved back to South Kensington. Uh, he adapted a large old billiard room uh, at the back as his studio. <laughs> uh, Nanny, Nanny Lightfoot, slept on the kitchen table. Oh, she's still <laughs> hanging out. With she's them, still huh? hanging out, man. Yeah, she's coming uh, along for the ride. They had a real a trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, they held illicit roulette parties organized by Bacon with the assistance of Hall. He loved to gamble uh, loved yes, it he would sense. win massive sums of money and equally he would lose massive sums of money uh he he loved it and of course you can you know london they had casinos in london at the time there would be a casino you could just pop over to he would spend whole nights there um and he was one of these guys he would much rather be at the casino with one of his east end um hunks uh, playing roulette and getting hammered than he would ever like want to talk about art like ugh, mm. like you know and i don't think he was kind of fronting either like i think he he just he was very workmanlike about the painting mm. um yeah which is which is interesting all right so now we're gonna we're gonna look at the the first painting that was the big breakthrough um and this is the 1944 painting that caused a, a scandal at the time i'm putting it in the chat if you're listening along i'm gonna ask the fellows to describe it um, but you can certainly look this up. It's very famous. Three studies for figures at the base of a crucifixion. This uh, is the painting that may have been partly inspired by the furies from Greek uh, mythology from um, Euripides and the Oresteia. Uh, I think um, I'll ask Jacob. So Jacob, what do you see here in this triptych? If you had to describe it to somebody who's uh, listening along. Man, it's uh, it's weird because it's so alien, but also it feels very familiar. Um, it's I guess the best way to put it is that they look like the wounded if uh, the Germans had bombed Whoville instead of uh, <laughs> London. Like it has a very kind of weird like Dr. Seuss quality to it, but it's yeah, it's a triptych it's you know three studies and they're just in in the in the three panels they're like in various poses of like almost sort of like gleeful pain like obviously because like they all have like two of the three of them have like their mouths open and screams or grimaces but there's like a weird joy about it maybe not the pain but by the fact that they're causing you distress by you looking at them and they're like backgrounded by like this very bright orange that sort of goes kind of against the whole darkness of the painting like it reminds me of the uh title of the first episode of the first season of true detective which is long bright dark like the sort of mm. sense that it's not an absence of light but rather like a kind of anti-light um yeah i mean it's and the fact that it's like you know, the so there's like and then the religious biblical imagery of it being at the base of a crucifixion so yeah. like just sort of the implication that these would be the figures who were like sort of staring up and like ogling and yapping at like you know one would have to be assume a christian martyr if not necessarily jesus um yeah yeah just sort Oof. of crazy shit 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. That mile from the middle triptych is the one on the right at a cursory glance. The one on the right is more disturbing. It's a little more eye catching, but the, actually the mouth in the middle figure, I think is ultimately the most unsettling. There's something so disembodied about it. There's it, to me, what looks like a field dressing near it by like a bandage it, which makes it feel like it's part of this injury but it's it's so disembodied and and yet hype almost i mean the mouth the actual mouth mouth is very realistic and yet it's it's set in this you know very unrealistic context it's it's i don't like looking at it the middle one i i, I but i also kinda, can't stop looking at it it's very it, it kind of reminds me of like Ralph yeah. Steadman kind yeah. of, you know, like There's illustrations of uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas kind of. Yeah, yeah. And and then, then shapes wise, just generally shapes. I, I, I just started thinking that you said Dr. Seuss. I love that. I, do you remember the furniture that the mother made in Beetlejuice? The furniture and sculptures that she made? I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but she was a she was a, a, a Winona Ryder's mother, right? Made this made this kind of post kind of awful, but kind of spooky gothic furniture and sculpture. This that reminds me of like a uh, try hard version of trying to do what Bacon is doing here, like a slightly sanitized uh, try hard version of that in terms of just the shape and the disposition of parts towards each other. But it's, it is unsettling. You do kind of also sense there's a part of me that's like, these things are uh, mal they they malfunction somewhere in their development. Like they were coming into being and, the process went haywire somehow. It's, yeah, it's it's kind of they're hard to they're hard to look at. Like Kevin, you were saying, like just staring. At, they're hard to look at, but you keep looking at them. Yeah, like the malformed <laughs> quality. Like you get the sense. It's like I mean, who knows? Like maybe like when he was like you know being whipped in the stables by like the groom. It's like you, the grooms and stuff. It's like they remind me of like the kind of like stillborn fetuses of like a horse or something like that you know yeah yeah oof right i mean and we can't forget uh you know he he's so obsessed with the scream and that business from battleship potemkin he kept um a still from that scene in his in his uh studio um this this was considered this is considered his first mature piece uh he regarded his works before the triptych as irrelevant and throughout his life tried to suppress their appearance on the market oh. when this painting was first exhibited in 1945 the war has just ended it caused a sensation and established him as one of the foremost post-war painters remarking on the cultural significance of three studies the critic john russell observed in 1971 that there was painting in england before the three studies and painting after them and no one can confuse the two mm -hmm. so this is it right uh three studies was painted over the course of two weeks in 1944 when bacon recalled i was in a bad mood of drinking and i did it under tremendous hangovers and drink I sometimes hardly knew what I was doing. I think perhaps the drink helped me to be a bit freer. So this was um, done in South Kensington, the in that billiards room. Um, this was yeah. the this was the beginning of of his career, wow. um, per his per his um, sentiment. So there's just, I mean, in the the Wikipedia article, and this is. Um, pretty pretty big for a single painting he would he would do a second version of it in 1988 which um is similar uh and also extremely eerie with a kind of almost like a deeper shade of red and uh he would um let me send a link over to you guys this is also worth looking at the the figure in the middle with the sort of strange piece of furniture that almost like has the scythe kind of a look to it uh, to the yeah. right this odd tripod with a like a leg that is like extraneous yeah it's almost like the thing has the red carpet pulled out for it yeah um, it like reminds this one especially reminds me of you know that movie the cell yeah where, where like 
uh, Jennifer Lopez goes inside the mind of the comatose serial killer. Mm. And it's like all this weird, like, it's like very sort of red and like, but like rotten red and stuff like that. Mm. It has mm-hmm. that kind of reminiscence yeah. to me. Yeah. Well, and, and Bacon would influence from this point forward. I mean, and, and his career would, this put him on the map. He, you know, this didn't immediately make him a superstar, but it was, and it took a while for people to come around. Uh, you know, you could about imagine if some newish painter springs on the scene with something like this, it would provoke some pretty strong feelings. It, it would really yeah. be easy to see it and, and ex- have the experience that I'm having now looking at it and being like, I hate that. Right. And oh, I'm, sure. appre- I'm appreciating it, but f- f- having the same reaction to it and being like, this is terrible. I don't want to look at this. <laughs> yes. Right. It, yeah. it, and it reminds me a little <clears throat> bit of Sarah Kane. Like, hey, mm-hmm. we're going to stare at this awful thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and you can you can imagine somebody having survived the Blitz or maybe having lost loved ones in the war uh, going into a museum. And this is what you want me to look yeah. at. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Right. Hey, how do you pay, paint some puppies? Right. <laughs> can you, haven't can we, you haven't we some... had enough? Yeah, yeah. I'm a little. <laughs> yeah. Read the room, Francis. Right. Uh well, so now I want to I want to look at another painting which follows very quickly on the heels of this painting, which to me is also staggering. It's just called painting, uh, and um, you know, you mentioned this the film, the cell. When they made Silence of the Lambs, they referred to to Bacon for um, uh, Lecter's escape, and oh, I also really? think for his yeah, I also think for for that the scene where he's in, he meets uh, Starling for the first time where he's in his cell and everything. Yeah. The people, Bacon's influence cannot be understated, but we're just going to look at painting, which was done in 1946, which is also something. So now he's very quickly, he, he finds his voice and he emerges fully fledged as a, as an artist. Um, Brad, what do you see when you look at this? Yeah, so this is there's uh, there's just a lot more uh, going on here, just in in terms of objects or whatever we want to call it, than there were than there were in the triptych. Um, we've got uh, some kind of dark figure in the f- kind of the foreground, or I guess the middle ground, in a sort of in funeral dress with a kind of an umbrella over his head, but it's kind of obscuring his face. This very, this yellow flower in his lapel, which is very sort of striking. Or, and, a, or a yellow star. Or a yellow, the could, period. right, yeah. right. Could be a, yeah, a yellow star. And in the, the, the figure is kind of obscured. I mean, there's there's legs in there, but it, it's a little bit blurry and it's sort of maybe seated. It's a little hard to understand even where that figure is kind of in space relative to the things behind him. There is a what's to me is clearly a, a animal being dressed. This is this is kind of what it looks like an exaggerated version of if you like kill a deer and 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 string it up or or a, a cow hung in a meat locker or something that's sort of in the background um and then in the foreground it's difficult to, for me to even understand really what i'm looking at there's there's it also looks like kind of it could even be meat processing some kind of there's there's two objects on the left and the right and they both look um they both look kind of like one, uh, I don't really know even what they are. They could be sort of like animal body parts or something set up on some kind of semicircular frame. Yeah, it's yeah. Just a now sort of it's, a nightmarish scene. Really. It really is, yeah. and it's it's possible that that frame. Uh, you know, people were always were always sort of are always sort of like running around to find meaning and meaning in Bacon's work as yeah. you do. Yeah. Um, it's possible that that circular sort of cage yeah. may be may be reminiscent of the um, the Nuremberg trials. Oh, where they okay. they put these you know you have the yellow star. Mm-hmm. So there's this sort of sense of like human or like not human, just history itself become is as like an abattoir, right? As like uh, a butcher butcher shop. Well, I can um, yeah, I can certainly I can certainly see that there is yeah, there's. 
it's there's something about that there is actually something about that little frame that circular thing that that the actual man-made geometry of that in this context is a little unsettling it's deeply itself. deeply right. unsettling yeah mm-hmm. I, right i want to read something here this is from the um the Toshin bacon Painting 1946 imposes a condition of absurdity as a coherent expressive reality. This approach, which appears here in all its obscene and horrifying plainness, will endure as one of the fundamental elements of Bacon's poetic. Different elements arouse the observer's sense of indecency, but the determining factors depend more on the structural components of the work than on explicit figurative details. The composition of this painting testifies to a mysterious adventure of modifications during its realization. Bacon started with the intention of depicting a landscape. As he proceeded, he inserted the motif of a chimpanzee in a field of grass that almost overwhelms it. This then evolved into a bird of prey, but the changes continued until everything was jumbled up in the final image, where the field has disappeared and only traces remain of the chimpanzee and the bird, even if they have been incorporated in other ideas or indistinguishable impressions. The outcome results from a learning process that is infinitely vaster and deeper than the logical, rational approach. So it's just, he, he went into this thinking, this painting started as a landscape. That's insane. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so he's using accident and chance and discovery and booze and, uh, you know, uh, and and what results is this incredible masterpiece. I can't remember. This painting to, is absolutely haunting. He did a different version of this Um uh later as well but i this one to me is just staggering i can't recall precisely who um who bought this but there was some collector might have been one of the sainsbury's um as i recall mm-hmm. who saw it and said i'll pay you 200 pounds for this yeah you know i'll pay you <laughs> you know i'll pay you a you know right. it'd be like a quarter what would that be right now let's see it'd be it'd be a hell of a lot of money at the, yeah. uh, you know now uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a deal <laughs> right, <laughs> like right, sold right. and now of course this would sell for for tens and tens Million. of millions yeah. of dollars yeah yeah. Pot, yeah so um i do love that that quote from him here i'm just looking at another article we are meat we are potential carcasses <laughs> from from bacon God. um so well, uh, you know he's got a name like Bacon. Of course he's going to think. Yeah, that. of course. That's yeah. Fun. Oh, it's, yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Good old eggs. Um, <laughs> and again, we're, we're getting really heavy here, and we are yeah. going to get to some more fun anecdotes about his his uh, you know his time at the colony, his drinking, and some of his love affairs and things. I know we're already into the third hour, but you know what? We're going to go a little long. This one's going to be you're going to just go with me. So Jacob, do you have anything to say about painting 1946? Uh, yeah, I mean, not much beyond what like Brad and you said. I I really love the whole avatar of history idea. It reminds me of Joyce, like history is a nightmare from which I'm unable to awake. Um, like I think my main takeaway into sort of riffing off the sort of Burton comparisons is it reminds me of like some like like if they decided to go really really dark with like the penguin in like a Batman comic. Like Mm -hmm. it had all like the purples and like the blacks and like the umbrella and everything. Like it just, it makes me imagine uh, not to be too cape shit brained, but like (laughs) if like a, a, you know, just fantasizing about like a one shot comic of Batman written or illustrated by uh francis bacon yeah right there is there is uh yeah i like the i like the penguin thing there is something about that i I got thinking about this purple and pink in here as we've been talking too and it's like something about putting pink in a painting like this a soft pink too not not a not a and and I, i noticed too apocalypse confidential and art of darkness have similar pink we use pink right uh but this it's this softish kind of pink there's something unsettling about it here too like it's flesh or something it's not it's not a a, a baby nursery pink it's it's vulnerable flesh and it's mm. uh, mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right and it's he that to- whole like mm-hmm. it's that whole like sort of you know just keep going with uh tim burton like the whole kind of like pastel gothic of like the neighborhood and edward yeah. scissorhands yeah. or like Pee Wee's big adventure, like the house, like it's brightly colored, but like there's like almost something like nauseating about like that pastel quality. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
to my untrained eye, he gets the depth of color and feeling out of his colors that Rothko does, but then goes further and creates real dramatic scenes with with these figures. He does it all, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I'm I'm a huge, huge fan. Um, all right. So we're going to get into a little more of the social life. We're going to back off from the paintings. But now we've got a real artist and real painter uh, on our hands. And I'm going to get into, for the remainder of the episode, I'm going to lean a lot on this Gilded Gutter Life book, which I really enjoy. If you read only one memoir about Francis Bacon, read this one, because it's just, I think it's so well written. Um, so... He's hanging out on the scene here in Soho, and um, I don't want to uh, describe every single haunt and hangout that they went to, because it would make the episode go on for six hours. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about his um, time at the colony. Uh, let's see here. One moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, Francis had been present at the birth of the colony when he met Brian Howard, who was part model for Anthony Blanche and Ambrose Silk in the novels of Evelyn, Evelyn Way. Is that how you say that? Um, oh. Ever, Evelyn Waugh Brian in the street. Visited, yeah. Yeah, Evelyn Waugh in the street. Um, I went there in 1949 with Brian Howard, he told me. I met the old bastard across the road and he said, there's a new club opening. Come across with me. And for some reason, I liked it so much that I went back the next day and Muriel came over to, and spoke to me. I don't know. Perhaps she thought I knew a lot of rich people, which, of course, was untrue. But she knew I hadn't got much money. And she said, I'll give you 10 pounds a week if you can drink and you can drink absolutely free here. And don't think of it as a salary, but just bring people in. So you were a tout, I suggested. I wasn't even a tout. Uh, she said, bring in the people you like. So. Muriel figured out uh, that Bacon would be an asset to to her place. And that arrangement lasted for a very long time. He would just bring people in and she would pay. Uh, uh, she would pay him. Um, did, sorry. Did Evelyn Waugh and Francis Bacon uh, have intimate? Um... No, I, I, I don't know. I didn't. I don't. I didn't read anything okay. about that. That's yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, he would he would uh, paint. um Muriel Belcher frequently. Oh, we're getting to the point here now too, where um, we're not, we haven't quite yet come to George Dyer, but some of the characters who appear in that film, I mentioned love is the devil. This is, you know, I think it's Deacon. Uh, is it George or Walter Deacon? Anyway, Deacon, um, uh, Muriel Belcher, some of these other characters, they appear in that, in that film. Um, let me see here. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, this is quite funny. This is just a little bit of the kind of character of um, Muriel Belcher. Uh, right. Seated on her stool, her black hair combed back severely, chin tilted upward, cigarette and raised hand, Muriel gave a deceptive impression of haughtiness as she surveyed the carrion of her membership, ready to rout strangers with her piercing cry of members only. <laughs> but though she was impressive, it took Francis to let me see her beauty. In the 1940s, Ang Angus McBean took a photographer, uh, put, took a photograph which shows her with a look of Hedy Lamar. And when I knew her better, I dared to ask about the rumor concerning a South American diplomat who had fallen in love with her. Perfectly true, dear. <laughs> I did have a Colombian gentleman who was in love with me. I don't know how it started or ended. Trespassing further, I, I asked about her other lovers, men or women. She answered tersely, I'm glad to say plenty of both, and shut the subject as firmly as a handbag. By the 1950s, she had a West Indian lover called Carma Carmel, uh, who frequently gambled with Francis, though she possessed none of his luck. Once she separated from Muriel and returned to Jamaica to regret it bitterly, phoning London one night with the sing-song wail, I want to come home. You are home, cunty, Muriel <laughs> reminded her, putting the phone down. But Carmel came back and Muriel was pleased. <laughs> mm, wow. So you have to imagine Muriel is this uh, sort of... She was like a curator of souls, right? right in this right. bar in Soho. And Francis was a prime get. Wow. And, um, wow. Yeah. And they just, he just lived it up. And uh, I don't want to give it all that much. I don't want it to seem, this episode has the potential to kind of wallow in dreariness and misery. And that's sure. not at all. This guy knew how to have fun. And he had a hell of a lot of fun in his life. And he he lived hard. Um so 
a little bit more about Muriel. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, he would wear makeup and stuff too. And he would yeah. wear um, like silk stockings and things. He, <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of he looked like a little bit like the cure in the eighties, you know, or, or the cure. Oh, in the yeah. 80s. Yeah. 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 Um, Though she vicariously enjoyed other, her members' successes, Muriel had not the slightest interest in art. She once said to Francis, I don't give a fuck about art. <laughs> <laughs> this we got to have her come on the pod. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this was an added strength. Generally, the last thing artists wish to talk about is art. And at Muriel's, they gossiped about the things that really mattered. Sex, <laughs> drink, scandal, and daydreams. Muriel's was anything but hallowed. Um, huh. though Francis was unknown to the public, he was revered by his contemporaries, especially within the small coterie, which met in the colony room and became known years later as the school of London. So this kind of happened. Um, somebody was writing, uh, in a catalog in 1976, there are artistic personalities in this small Island, more unique and strong, and I think numerous than anywhere in the world outside America's jolting vigor. There are 10 or more people in this town and not far away of world class, including my friends of abstract persuasion. In fact, I think there is a substantial school of London. Within mm -hmm. 11 years, the label, label was sufficiently secure for Art International to run a series of articles on the school. Um, better labeled as Muriel's Boys or the Colony Room Mob, this so-called school included Francis, Lucian Freud, Michael Andrews, Frank Auerbach, and Tim Behrens. The bond they shared was drinking at Muriel's. Francis painted Muriel and Freud. Um, mm. In 1952, Freud painted his fam famous portrait of Bacon, full face looking downwards in oil on copper, a small portrait of extraordinary power measuring only 17.8 by 12.8 centimeters. Um, it was acquired by the Tate and stolen well in Berlin, never seen again. Huh. Um, Francis said, uh, he was convinced it was stolen specifically because it was an outstanding portrait of himself. <laughs> <laughs> the thieves knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, so, I mean, we could linger on the colony, but in the interest yeah, of time, you know, I want to move Sounds forward. like a fascinating scene for sure. They were having, they were having yeah. a really, really good time. I mean, and that was, that was the scene for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. and they got to, they got to see him, um, get all the way. Right. Um, that's in, that's got to be fascinating, right? It's, it's kind of hanging out. And then suddenly this guy you're hanging out with is becoming, uh, you know, there's probably a little bit of a jealous competition, I'm sure. Oh, there was a lot. Yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a but, but without a doubt, Francis, Francis won the day. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's no question. Um, just a few little more anecdotes because it's just too fun. Um, at Muriel's, as at Wheeler's, Francis always signed the bill or the round was simply added to the tab. And I assume that by the time of my arrival, the days of his weekly 10 pound touting fee were over. Instead, Muriel seemed to allow him limitless credit. He waved his bottle of champagne, slopping it into the glasses of those around him, spilling much of it on the floor. And with the Edwardian toast, real pain for your sham friends, champagne for your real friends, a habit he had acquired from his father. He would add his inimitable cheerio with a radiant smile and a tug at his collar, an image that shines brightly in my mind today. Um, <laughs> yeah, he talked about wanting to unleash the valves of feeling as an artist to just get you get you somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to we're going to punch forward. We're going to look at. A couple of more paintings. We're going to get to his first major lover. Oh, we've got so much. We've got so much more to go. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta start moving. I gotta move. I gotta move. 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 Okay. Here we go. So, I want to talk about his time in Monte Carlo when he was gambling. Um, but first, Brad, what's your what's your impression impression of Francis Bacon so far? I I'm, I'm into this man. This, this story is is interesting, and like so many of these significant artists you can kind of tell there's you can he's a a fractal of 20th century history in a way you know you can kind of see him you can see history in him and him in history it's pretty interesting uh, you know I, I shied away from looking very closely at much of his work as we were arrived starting to come at this episode because I like to come in as 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 uh, uh naive as I can you know um so what we're looking at so far I'm I'm uh, 
repulsed and drawn to simultaneously so that's that's a pretty cool feeling uh especially it, it, interestingly enough it feels like you know we come in a time well past bacon we're sort of desensitized to some of this stuff and yet he does have a qual an ability still to unnerve which i find interesting like you know, you mentioned Marilyn Manson earlier. I, you know, I, I can look at a picture of Marilyn Manson, Antichrist superstar, which is intended to be a provocative, disturbing image. Uh, it doesn't really bother me that much. <laughs> but this, yeah, looking yeah. at Francis Bacon painting 1946, the more I look at it, I, I'm worried it's going to infect me somehow. Absolutely. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Well, so I'm going to read a little bit more from The Gilded Gutter Life. Um, Monte Carlo, with its lush life in casino, was where Francis had been on gambling trips paid for by Eric Hall. In the 50s, when the friendship was going well, the Sutherlands witnessed a historic win, though the amount seems negligible now, 1,600 pounds. It was so considerable at the time that they urged Francis to return to England or entrust the money to someone to take it back for him. You've made enough never to worry again. But that is not the way of the gambler. Instead, he invited them to the Hotel de Paris for one of the most memorable dinners of their lives, taking the precaution of renting a villa for the rest of the year with a large deposit at a nearby delicatessen. Then he went back to the casino and lost the rest. <laughs> so that's quite funny. Yeah. Uh, and so he's staying in Monaco now uh, with, with Nan. Uh, he paint, paints all day, gambles at night. The nurse is knitting in the sun. Um he was described as being being very kind. Uh, it was amusing to find that the furnishings included the most comprehensive library of literature on sexual perversions imaginable, which added a certain zing to hot afternoon siestas, as well as a cupboard off my own bedroom filled with intensely alarming images on canvas left by Francis in various stages of abandonment. And abandonment. So you come down to see Francis in uh, Monte Carlo, and he's got like bdsm literature and his crazy paintings and then his little his little nurse is knitting in the next room <laughs> <laughs> and he's getting ready to go to the casino um so i'm gonna reiterate this story similarly failing to learn from experience francis frequently left behind canvases which were sold by those who came after him in the 60s the playwright frank norman witnessed a scene on bond street in london when francis passed a gallery and spotted a picture of his which he had discarded in tangier we're going to get to tangier that's where burroughs and company mm -hmm. shows up going inside he asked how much it cost and was told fifty thousand pounds Writing a check without a moment's pause, he carried the picture outside where he stamped it to death on the on the pavement. <laughs> Unreal. So by the 60s, he had that kind of money. In the mm -hmm. 50s, he was still skint and kind of he yeah. had to win at the casino. Um, this guy, I mean, he's describing it. We were so broke, we had nothing to eat. You know, you're staying yeah, at a little hotel. Right. I mean, this guy, again, that's the gilded gutter life, isn't it? Right. Um, right. Just an incredible story. All right. Wow, so let's wow. keep punching along here. Uh, Jacob, do you do you like to gamble? Uh, I've played a, from time to time, but I'm not much of a gambling man. <laughs> you're not. All right, you're more of a literati. You're more of a an intellectual. I think. I can't, yeah, I, I can't. definitely relate to the drinking parts of this, but not so much the gambling parts of it. Yeah, to me, it's just like, well, you could have spent all that money on booze and food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I've never been much of a gambler either. I guess. Yeah. Right. Well, it was around this point where Nan uh, dies. Uh, yeah, she died in 1951. So we're sort of sad to see Nan go. Uh, he was yeah. gambling in Nice when he learned about her death. And um, so obviously that, that made him quite sad. Um, at this point, he was being represented by, um, I think it's called the Hereford Gallery, um, a relatively smaller um uh, sort of a agency gallery type thing that took him on as a bit of a shot in the dark. He'd eventually upgrade to the Marlboro Gallery. That's coming. Um, and at this point in his life, he gets into the Pope's. So we're mm -hmm. going to look at another painting now. This is the study after Velasquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X. Let me find the link. This painting is wild let me find mm -hmm. it here you go i'll send you guys the link right now it's it's almost like 
well, I don't want to, I don't want to give it away, but uh, he, he, he actually, when he was in, I think in Spain, he avoided seeing the original painting. He only worked <laughs> from photographs of it. So uh, Jacob, what, what do you see in this painting? Oh, when you, um, well, it's, it's a clap. Hold on. Sorry. Windows mm -hmm. are going crazy on me. It's uh, one of his classic screams. That's for sure. And it's like this shrouded figure, obviously the Pope. And he's sitting, sitting in this golden chair kind of throne, but it's more minimalist. It's interesting. You do get a sort of sense of his like interior designer past by the way that he like depicts furniture and furnishings in his paintings. Um, but the most striking thing to me is how it's like complete. There's like these streaks to it. Like it's almost like the 1950s by way of 1590s way of like a uh, vapor wave, like how it has all like those like VHS, like distortion lines. Um, yeah. I don't know. This is definitely one of my favorites of his just cause it's so uh, gothic and like it has like that definitely that like kind of medieval feeling to it yeah. what do you think brad well yeah no it, it, i seen that i've seen this before and uh, many times and there, i think of a couple things i mean one i do the streaking is the streaks in it are compelling and i almost think it's like the pope is screaming at in the process of being like dematerialized of being like beamed up or something right like he's going to be beamed into hell or beamed into a million you know a trillion atoms or something like that there's something about literally like the pope is losing his materiality um the original velasquez painting is a a, a great painting and has these uh wonderfully rendered uh textures and surfaces that are that are really quite impressive and and there's uh, the ghost of that is in here uh, to some degree, but of course it's, it's not, he's not a, going for any sort of that, the realism that Velasquez is. It also reminds me of, um, the, uh, the cover of, oh, what is that movie? Screen, uh, not screamers. What is that movie? There's scanners. A movie. Scanners. Yes. It reminds me of the yeah. cover, the poster of scanners, uh, for people who've seen that, which was, I remember going to the little independent video store when I was a very little kid renting other movies. We never rented scanners, of course, but always seeing that box and just being like having the same feeling I have now compelled to look at it not really comfortable looking at it at the same time. And and they're, you know, it's yeah. really pulling. You're taking me back right? to being like nine or 10 years old. You go to the movie store and you would go down the horror aisle and just yeah. be scared to death by just <laughs> these covers of these VHS tapes. Just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, some, I, I yeah. could never rent that. And then of course, half the time the movies would, would not even live up to the cover no. yeah 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 no so, it, that, it, that, yeah. so this this image somehow it, i somehow via that saw this image before i saw it if that makes sense now this one in particular i have seen in you know recent years as an adult but like i somehow have this scream deep in my psyche um, without a doubt yeah. yeah and if you yeah so he would do a series of around 50 of these uh variants wow. of the Velasquez paintings and wow. just a little bit about it when asked why he was compelled to revisit the portrait again and again he replied that he had nothing against popes but merely sought an excuse to use these colors and you can't give ordinary clothes that purple color uh without getting into a sort of <laughs> false fauve manner at the time bacon which is very funny he's being funny uh, yeah um, because well okay 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 frank yeah, okay, all right, it's... Francis. Yeah, 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 yeah. At, at the time, Bacon was coming to terms with the death of a cold disciplinarian father, his early illicit sexual encounters, and a very destructive sadomasochistic approach to sex. Almost all of the popes are shown within cage-like structures and screaming or about to scream. Bacon identified as a Nietzschean and atheist, and some contemporary critics saw the series as symbolic execution scenes, as if Bacon sought to enact Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead by killing his representative on Earth. Other critics see the series as symbolizing the killing of the father figure. However, Bacon balked at such literal translations and later said that it was Velasquez himself he sought to triumph over. He said that in the same way that Velasquez cooled Titian, uh, he sought to cool Velasquez. Um, 
Hmm. Very interesting. Another one that's worth looking at. Um, we're, we're not going to go into it. I'm going to put the link in the chat though for the boys here is head six, which um, is considered a, a masterpiece. This is, this is an earlier painting from 1949. Uh, it was the first of the, of the Pope paintings. Um, and this is another one which people, where there's like he, the Pope figure is screaming inside of a kind of a, a square box and some people have noted the similarity to this and and the Nuremberg trials with the um where the when the Nazis were put in sort of like these boxy um cages when they were they when they were put on trial. Right. Um so fun times with Francis Bacon. Um <laughs> oh I have I have a little bit about that painting from the Gilded Gutter Life. Let me find it. Um and again, he he kind of I don't want to say he disavowed them, but he he really sort of felt like he could have done a better job with these, whatever that means, like as he matured, as he went on, but they're, they're pretty widely regarded as masterpieces, not all 50, but the ones we looked at are, um, let me see here. I've got something. Oh, this is the business about the, um, yeah, here we go. Here's, uh, Francis during the course of an interview. Uh, I did the whole series of the popes for a curious reason. I bought a book on diseases of the mouth when I was quite young. It had always fascinated me, and I'd also been hypnotized by the portrait of Innocent X at that time. I thought that the color of the portrait and the mouth, the saliva and the glitter of the mouth, I would be able to make a marvelous image. But I never succeeded in doing it. When the Pope was screaming, it wasn't screaming. I wanted to make the scream into something which would have the intensity and beauty of a Monet sunset. Hmm. Yeah. So he, uh, yeah. Well, this obsession, this is interesting that he spends so much time trying to sort of exorcise or understand or something, this, this book of mouth diseases. It's like, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's interesting. Yeah. It, it, you, to take an obsession like that seriously is, is, is fascinating right i mean i think you know part of an artist's job is to like make the thing they're interested in interesting to everybody else and yeah you see him trying to sort that out in this very odd an odd reference that any of the three of us might pick up and kind of look at and kind of be freaked out by and sort of put away and never think about again but yeah all right we're coming up to the tangier and peter lacy period uh but before we do i want uh to hear Jacob, I'm showing you a painting called Two Figures, which uh, his friends and people referred to as the buggers. What do you what do you <laughs> what do you see in this painting? Oh, class. Well, it's. Yeah, I mean, this is like the epitome of all of the weird sexual freak shit that Francis Bacon is into. Like, it looks like. It looks more like they're wrestling each other or fighting each other. But, you know, as the sort of unofficial affectionate title is the buggers, they're doing a lot more than that. And it has like a similar kind of streaks of the uh, uh, Velasquez study. Um, yeah, another very uh, striking one. It looks and it almost looks like surreptitiously done. Like it looks like a old like 1950s like fuzzy like like voyeur like peeping tom photography thing that's a good point mm. yeah. yeah well and and you're right on because it was based on a series a motion series of photographs of men wrestling that mybridge <laughs> published in 1880 uh of course, yeah. it's a mix of both right i mean i'm sure yeah. he was influenced by the photographs but then it's, it has uh, this... it's clearly on a bed right yeah yeah I, yeah, the one thing you look at it as you look closer and you really start to think about it, you're like, well, and I don't want to get technical here. I, I don't think based on their body positions, I don't think he they can be somewhere adjacent to having sex. But I don't think based on their body position, they're, we're witnessing a guy actually screwing another guy at the moment. It's because uh, that's not how their bodies are actually set up. It's very. Huh. Interesting. Well, and and Bacon absolutely had a like he wanted to be raped. He had rape fantasies. He yeah. his 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 masochism went to that degree. Right. He wanted right. a guy who would 
whip him with a belt, yeah. you know, tie him down and violently. Yeah. yeah, he was that was that was Francis. Um mm. the same way he would tear his paintings apart, he wanted to be torn apart. Yeah. Sure. Um well, so we're going to get into um Peter Lacey and Tangier. And I'm going to blast forward a little bit past their meeting. Um uh, I'm just going to blast through a few key points. So uh, at this point, Francis is still with the, I, I got it wrong earlier. He's still with the Hanover gallery, uh, which, you know, represented him for the beginning of his career. And at this point he met a man who was sort of described as his first um, major love, um, Peter Lacey, but just describe him a little bit. Um, and uh, Lacey was a, a Royal Air Force pilot. Um yeah, he was he had been a fighter pilot in the Battle of, of Britain, which it's pretty heavy, right? Um let's see. Lacey did not give the appearance of being homosexual. He belonged to a period when it was important to be accepted as normal, so he played the part accordingly. His nephew, a Royal Navy Padre, wrote to me, It would figure in my mind that he was happier in male company and that he mixed in art circles. What a fascinating man Francis Bacon must have been. Ian Board remembers that Lacey loved his drink and also that he was very fond of Leonard, the man who introduced him to Francis, a diminutive stockbroker with a tortoise-like face of Leslie Henson, a well-known comedian of the time. Francis was very jealous, he recalled. He loathed Leonard. Lacey's looks were interesting, too desiccated to be described as handsome, with the bleached appearance of someone left out in, a, in the tropical sun. In those early days, he gave the sense of a man who did not belong in England, a remittance man on leave, feeling his way after an absence of several years in a city he scarcely recognized. There was a touch of vulnerability, though no effeminacy, a characteristic that Francis deplored. So, um, hmm. Hmm. yeah, this is funny because now this is... um. This is Daniel Farson writing. I regret that I failed to buy the portrait PL Peter Lacey painted in 1962. One of Francis's simplest of Peter sitting on a banquette facing the artist, the Marlboro, the gallery he would eventually go to were asking a thousand pounds at the time and offered to let me pay in installments. But I was daunted by such a sum, which was particularly foolish as I liked the picture without any thought of investment. He could have, yeah, he could have, uh, uh, you know, a hundred X is money yeah, <laughs> or more. Sure. Right, yeah. A thousand X. It's difficult to know if any relationship meant as much to Francis as that with Peter Lacey. Years later, he told me how lucky he had been to meet Lacey when he was nearly 60, though in fact he was in his late forties. This made it all the more extraordinary that Peter should have fallen for me at any age. We got on really well. He was a remarkable man. So, they end up in Tangier together, uh, but I mean, their relationship was pretty violent. He was a sadist. Lacey was spurred to violence. Lacey would beat Bacon. Bacon enjoyed it. At one point in England, Lacey simply threw him through a plate glass window from the second floor to the garden below, and that only made Francis love him more. Um, so they had a, a violent relationship. So you're dealing with like just a lot of um a lot of drinking and a lot of like like homosexual intensity yeah was was bacon's drinking alcoholic or he, was it party he, like he you're, he you're ma I mean? he managed it but it 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 was it was bad yeah. i mean it was yeah it, he managed well enough and he never had of course never had children or anything right, so i mean he right. only but there were times he would black out yeah. and stumble yeah. down the stairs, not remember. Yeah. So I would say problem drinking. I mean, right. he, you know, I don't know if we should say alcoholic per se, but yeah. Um, so uh, let's see here. This is somebody describing Peter Lacey um, in Tangier at a gay bar called Dean's. Mm. Three o'clock, terribly hot, woke, 
parched. So got downstairs from my room in the Minza somehow, no lift again, and crawled across the courtyard past the potted palms, keeping well clear of the sunlight. I did what I knew I was going to do anyway and seared for the eternal twilight of Dean's bar, partly to watch him trafficking in small purple birds whose bottoms he stuffed with cannabis and sold for export, but mostly for the music, which forever poured from an upright piano whose top was four ranks deep in empty glasses. This cigarette scarred instrument produced an inspired stream of music, which I had never known to end before or seven in the morning, at which hour the performer would sway and his face collapsed gravely into the keys with a faint but haunting discord. This was Peter Lacey at the piano. At half past three, the bar was quiescent and the clientele as unremarkable as one could wish. Although my glance did linger on a large man in rolled up shirt sleeves, he was broad shouldered, rubicund, and definitely looked like an Englishman, except that I thought his eyes probed a little too far, further in fact, than was good for them. He had a bottle of champagne beside him and was covered in splashes of paint. He leaned carelessly on the counter with his back to the bottles, his cross legs adorned with a pair of green Wellington boots. I had a feeling I ought to know who he was and that I had seen him in Soho, but that didn't surprise me at all since Dean Barr was twinned with Muriel's. Have a glass of champagne, he said lazily. This was Francis. Robin refused the champagne for he was drinking gin and tonic. He ordered two more, one of which he carried over to the piano. Thanks, said Lacey, relinquishing the bass with his left hand to take the glass. His right was already rippling into the opening of I get a kick out of you. He took a profound swallow of gin. He was a man who could do several things at once. Cigarette? No, mustn't stop. Dean's watching. I never thought about it, but I suppose Peter Lacey was about 40 when I got to know him at Dean's. I never met him anywhere else. I don't think many other people did either. He was rumored to have a flat out at Miramar along the beach, but nobody I knew had been there. Perhaps he didn't live anywhere. As far as I was concerned, he lived in Dean's. To look at him, he ought never to have been just a pianist, not even an enthralling pianist, not even a pianist in a place which attracted as many eccentric people as Dean's. He had the face of a poet who has dropped in to remark that life after death is tolerable, a calm, ageless face impossible to classify as either drunk or sober until the last gin went into reverse, usually at about sunrise. His long hair was brushed smoothly back to show the whole of his well-shaped face. Anyway... Hmm. So he was he was sort of Peter Lacey, I think, owed a debt to the owner of Dean's bar um, and I think was just almost sort of like indentured to the piano there. Um, <laughs> so just painting a little bit of um, uh, of that, yeah, that scene. scene. Yeah. Yeah. This is another little thing. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Right here. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody is talking about how exhausted he looks, and then he talks to the owner, and he's like, he's never, the owner's like, he's never happy except when he's playing the piano, said Dean, unless he's playing back or at the casino when I give him money. He gestured at Peter's elegant back. Very bad, but now he is working, enjoying himself, not throwing my money away. His money, Dean. His money, my mm -hmm. money. Who knows whose money it is in the end? But this is appalling. When does he sleep and eat? Doesn't he get to bed? Even when the place closes, he lives on music. Besides, you know, I never close. It's true he misses London sometimes, he added. He talks about Soho until I almost feel I have been there. I shall go there one day and see your famous Miss Belcher. When I retire from my 90th birthday, I shall walk in and buy your Miss Belcher some good champagne. So very, very <laughs> funny. Um, let's see here. Yeah, he was there. And so the, Felsen was there years later, uh, Farson rather, uh, years later on the night that Dean came to the colony. Uh, he didn't buy Muriel any champagne. He was so intimidated that he tried to impress her by remarking that they had many friends in common. Yes, Muriel <laughs> replied with unusual animosity. All dead. Wow, jeez. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's here's um, Ted Morgan in his uh, Burrow, uh, Burroughs biography describing Francis Bacon as 47 looking 35. With a spoiled, tragic face, he said his reputation was a lot of chic shit and that his real love was gambling. He had once won $4,000 at Monte Carlo. He told Alan Ginsberg that he had also once been offered a gambling stake for allowing himself to be whipped with a bonus for every stroke that drew blood. Bacon's painting technique was what he called psychic representation. The face formed as if by accident in a whirl of feathery brushstrokes. Bacon said de Kooning was the great man in the United States for bursting through the abstract and planting an image on the canvas. Mm. Alan Ginsberg 
thought that Bacon, Bacon painted the way Burroughs wrote. It was a sort of dangerous bullfight of the mind where he placed himself in acute psychic danger of uncovering some secret that would destroy him. Burroughs had these unpublished mad routines about talking assholes with the recurring image of the spurting hard on as the hanged man neck, man's neck snaps and vast paranoiac theories of agents and psychic senders taking over the world in bureaucratic conspiracies. But Burroughs, although fond of Bacon, denied that there was any connection and said, Bacon and I are at opposite ends of the spectrum. He likes middle-aged truck drivers, and I like young boys. Oh. He sneers at immortality, and I think it's the uh, the one thing of importance. Of course, we're associated because of our morbid subject matter. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So now, now they're hanging out in Tangier, uh, yeah. and uh, he and Burroughs um, uh, have a discussion. So... <laughs> Uh, do you, do you want to, uh, do you want to hear some of it? Uh, you sure. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob, you, know, you, you want to hear, you know, you I like Burroughs anecdotes for sure. Yep, Let's go yep. for it. Yeah. All right. I mean, it was, we're, we're, we're going all the way back to art of darkness episode one. We got to revisit Burroughs cause we were, we were a little light. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's bacon. Uh, I don't know if critics of literature are the idiots that critics of painting are in this country because they're the biggest idiots uh, that exist. They know absolutely fuck all about it to begin with. They've got no <laughs> instinct about it. They've just got theories. Burroughs. In Tangier, I remember we had several discussions about pa painting bacon. Did we? Burroughs. Yes, much of the time. I remember you saying most of what is going on in painting isn't painting at all. Bacon, did I? <laughs> Maybe we were talking about abstract painting. Once it was the height of fashion. I don't know why. It's never meant anything to me. To me, even the best of it is just decoration. Jackson Pollock's paintings might be very pretty, but they're just decoration. I always think they look like old lace, but that's a terrible thing to say to an American of an American hero. Burroughs, no, not mine. Bacon. <laughs> I always think, and, th and I think this meeting happened... This is this meeting happened in 1986, so I don't want to conflate oh, this yeah. with the tangent yeah. period. Um, Bacon. Uh, I always think marvelous paintings will come out of America because it should, a country with an enormous mixed race, but it doesn't. It's so dreary. Those super realists, the abstract expressionists, it's all so dreary, Burroughs, but there must be some modern painters you admire. Bacon, not many, not now. They're all dead. There's Mark Boyle, Richard Hamilton. I'm interested sometimes in what they do, but I'm afraid this isn't really a country of painters, just Turner. At least we had Turner. And if you don't know Turner, you need to know Turner. Burroughs, and what about the Americans? Say Jasper Johns, Bacon. I try never to think about Jasper Johns. I hate the stuff and don't like him either. I met him in Paris. It was mutual. He didn't like me. It does happen. <laughs> so I just, I don't know. <laughs> Very cool to think about them hanging out in the, yeah. in the 80s, you know, like yeah, when they've sure. both been fully recognized as, um, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, as sort of legendary. Um so there's more to that. And I, I think actually you can find you can find that meeting, I think, on YouTube. There's some pretty good, oh, cool. Some cool. pretty good bacon content. All right, okay. Uh so I've got the discussion with Burroughs. We're in um 1956. Uh we're we're heading up toward the first um Tate retrospective, which for an artist in Britain would be I mean, it's it's it'd be like winning the um like the Pulitzer Prize or something or, yeah. or something as big as that. I yeah. mean, it's just even bigger, really. Um, but uh, so now I'm going back to the Revelations book uh, and to get a little bit more about Peter Lacey. Is this making sense? Am I building a character? Can you, yeah, can you, can yeah. you hear his voice and sort of feel who you're dealing with? Here? I definitely am starting to get a sense of who this guy is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Uh, why do I have this? Um, what am I, what am I doing on this page? There's so much, I've got so many, <laughs> what is even going on? 1956, Why is this eight retrospective? Do I have this right? I don't even know if I have the right page for this. Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very cool. This is very, very interesting. 
So I want to describe a little bit of like what Tangier was like at this period. Tangier was a lady with a reputation. She historically attracted not only invaders who valued the strategic location of the port just across the strait from Gibraltar, but also smugglers, exiles, and travelers with an eye for the exotic. The adventurous hoped to find in a port poised between Europe and Africa, Africa, whatever was missing at home, which was often sexual adventures that could only be dreamed of elsewhere. The English maintained a naval base at Gibraltar in order to protect their Mediterranean trade routes, but they also took an avid interest in Tangier, which was briefly an English colony in the 17th century. And between periods of Moroccan rule, it was dominated by the Western colonial powers. In 1923, England, Spain, and France agreed to turn Tangier into an international zone getting back to the burroughs episode mm, right yeah this international status reinforced the conviction wrote one historian that tangier was a city apart from the world on the edge of a continent overlooking two oceans caught between africa and europe between islam judaism and christianity so of course this would this would attract um quite a lot of people yeah, it now it became law it became somewhat lawless Yes, yeah. yes. And, and we're going to yeah. get to the point where they eventually crack down on it. But uh, let me read about sort of like what was going on here. Um, Flocks of young Spanish and Moroccan men filled the street. The soft eyed charm of young Mediterranean men was alluring for European homosexuals as the grand tour itself was as alluring. Uh, few homosexual travelers then considered sex with adolescent boys wrong. And among Arab men who had little money for access to women before marriage, which often did not occur until they reached their late twenties, a youthful period of same sex recreation was not necessarily regarded as sexually definitive or perverse. There were thousands of Spanish boys and also Moroccan boys and everybody did whatever they wanted. No problem. Said Mohammed Murabit. Expatriates mm -hmm. typically employed one or more houseboys who might provide additional services, and pickups were easily found in the streets and bars of the old town, especially around the Café Central or the beach cafes and the public baths. Narcotics were as easy, easy to come by as sex. One often fueled the other. Bacon dropped easily into the English community. Uh, the Tangier Gazette announced his arrival on June 29th, 1956, in typical village style. In Tangier for a holiday is the young English painter Francis Bacon, whose work is considered by experts to be England's most outstanding contribution to the arts since the end of the war. Bacon. He, oh, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. He's down here to fuck. I was going to say, he prefers being whipped, beaten, and gambling to opium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Bake, he once attempted to fuck one of his you know, lady friends. It did not go swimmingly. Um, Bacon, whom we met the other evening, is quite unlike the conventional idea of the artist, but then the mo most genuine artists are. We found him reluctant to talk about himself or his work, and it was from his friends and admirers that we learned how highly he is regarded and that he represented England at the last Venice Biennale. By an all. Um, <laughs> so fine, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we get a little bit of an idea of what's going on down there in, in Tangier. Um, got another, let's see here. It was around this period where he he moved over to the um to the uh to the new gal gallery, the Marlboro Gallery, because they could crack him into New York. There was a little bit of a sense of betrayal. Um, involved, but it, it's sort of like somebody going to the major leagues, you know, you can't, or like, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, transferring into a better school or something like that. It's like, you can't, you know, um, he did, he, he was torn about it because he did have a sense of loyalty, but he, loyalty, but he had to kind of upgrade and the Marlboro really took his career into their hands. They took it by the teeth. They saw that he was going to be the cash cow. They just had to figure out how to market him. Um, mm -hmm. And they they eventually did, um, and they helped him get that first Tate retrospective, which um, was absolutely. Uh, That's what we need, Kevin. We need yeah. somebody to figure out how to market us. Yeah, yeah. Patreon. We need a patron out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jacob, you have any interest? <laughs> you want a patron? You want to I'll, I'll get on it. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I'll find my I'll find my patron, and yeah, then you, you know we'll just have a sort of Russian nesting doll of patrons. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That sounds like a plan. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. This is a. Uh, yeah. So he's hanging out with the uh, Burroughs. There's a picture of Burroughs who always looked very stylish, didn't he? Burroughs, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, see. yeah, dude. That's how that's how you uh, kept the authorities from thinking you're up to something. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hide, hide in plain sight. You know. Meanwhile, you're shooting heroin and yeah, having let's, red let's boys read, and read a little more here. By the time he met Bacon, Burroughs, now living on the ground floor, was more interested in drugs than in alcohol, and Bacon's asthma kept him from the many forms of marijuana and hashish available in Tangier. They also made his face blow up like a balloon. But the nihilistic, anything-goes spirit of Burroughs and Ginsburg impressed him. He was naturally curious about the Americans. He had never been to America, but was, of course, aware of the growing reputation of its artists and writers. He wanted his next show in New York to be especially strong, he had told Erica, the woman at the Marble Gallery, I believe. Now here in Tangier, he found two Americans who regarded the illusions of Western culture with the same contempt that he did. Burroughs particularly attracted him. Just as Bacon was trying to settle down and perhaps change the tenor of his art, he observed inaction and inaction, arguably the most uncompromising sensibility of the period, a man who could make Bacon look pious by comparison. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Right, yeah, there was almost criminal freedom to Burroughs and an almost criminal joy. He appeared to subsist on drugs and boys, Guns interested in him almost as much as drugs and sex did, and everyone knew that he had killed his wife while trying to shoot an apple off her head like William Tell. Uh, there's a little there's a little bit, um, I don't know if I'm gonna read it, but I recall that like Tennessee will Tennessee was so sentimental that he would he would fall in love with like the rent boys. He'd fall mm-hmm. in love with them, and then he would be sort of disappointed when it was it wouldn't be reciprocated, and all the other kind of queers were like. Tennessee, Dude. they're yeah. they're prostitutes. Yeah. Like what do you, you call you know, yeah. cool your you know, just they don't want they don't know want what, anything to do with this. Yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um Burroughs and Ginsburg were delighted with Bacon. Ginsburg called him the most interesting person here. Which if Ginsburg is saying that about you, that's some serious stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and reported that Bacon promised to paint a big pornographic picture of me and Peter Arlovsky. <laughs> Bacon sometimes spent evenings at the uh, Via Muniria and invited them to his flat. They once found him at uh, the Bowles house at uh, 3 a.m. as Paul played tapes of Indian music, rolled huge bombers, marijuana joints, and discussed medicine with Burroughs. Ginsburg described Bacon, a great English painter who looks like an overgrown 17-year-old schoolboy born in Dublin, started painting late in 30, and now he's 47 and wears sneakers and tight dungarees and black silk shirts and always looks like going to tennis, likes to be whipped and paints mad gorillas in gray hotel rooms dressed in evening dress with deathly black umbrellas. He's like Burroughs a little, painting a a sideline, gambles at Monte Carlo and wins and loses all his painting money, says he can always be a cook or in trade if he fucks painting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, a very, that's a very beat passage right there very cool yeah, yeah yeah paul 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 bowles you mentioned there paul bowles is quite a figure in, in his own right great writer sheltering sky music composer he's is sort of the the godfather of the of the tangiers expat art scene well maybe we'll visit tangiers again uh so we're we're gonna leave tangier here shortly i've got a couple more things to read then we're gonna get to the first uh retrospective at look we're going we're heading into hour four i you know enjoy i hope you're enjoy, you're enjoying don't uh you know <laughs> pause it if you need a break i don't need a break i could i could go all night here all just right. like just like francis could go all night yep. <laughs> i'm ready to rock I'm, i might go to the casino after this <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting jacked. Um, so uh, yeah, he's talking about art here a little bit um, that I want to read. And this was in an interview, I think, with this Farson fellow, um, or like a discussion they had. Do you think there's any point in talking about art at all? It's always a fascinating subject because people reveal themselves talking about art, not about art, but about their attitudes to life. And, you know, it's almost an impossible thing to talk about because I think Pavlova was right when somebody asked her what she meant when she was dancing the dying swan. And she said, well, if I could tell you, I wouldn't dance it. If you could tell all about art, would you paint? Certainly not, because it's something that lies long and far below what is called coherence and consciousness. And one hopes the greatest art is a kind of valve in which very many hidden things of human feeling and destiny are trapped, something that can't be definitely and directly said. 
Yeah. Your art is often referred to as being sensational. Can you explain that? What do you mean by the word sensational? They're shocked by it. They find it evil, horrifying, unpleasant. I think it is that sometimes I have used subject matter, which people think is sensational, because one of the things I have wanted to do was to record the human cry. And that in itself is something sensational. And if I could really do it, and it's one of the most difficult things to do in art, and I wouldn't say that I've ever been able to do it, or perhaps has yet been able to do it, it would be, of course, sensational. When you say the human cry, what do you mean? The whole coagulation of pain, despair. What about the reverse side of life, Francis? Happiness and love. Why paint only despair and pain? Well, happiness and love is a wonderful thing to paint also. I always hope I will be able to do that too. After all, it's only the reverse side of the shadow, isn't it? Does it matter that a lot of people are not able to understand your paintings? Well, I don't think that you could be interested in whether people understand your paintings or not. It's only due to your own nervous system that you can paint at all. And you know, this is perhaps an aside, but there was a very interesting thing that Valerie said about modern art. And it's very true. He said that modern artists want the grin without the cat. And by that, he meant that they want the sensation of life without the boredom of conveyance. One of the things that is very interesting is that in the last 50 years, people, all the movements have been abstract. So the thing is, how can I draw one more veil away from life and present what is called the living sensation more nearly on the nervous system and more violently? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's, you're dealing, he, he, you're, he's not, yeah, he's not um, an, an idiot savant by any means. I mean, he's, no. he's thought deeply about this stuff and, um, Right. So we're going to go back yeah, to Jan Tangier it. for one last little bit. So there was a, and Brad, you probably know about this because of the, your study of burrows and everything, but there was a, there was a crackdown yeah. um, in Tangier yeah. uh, where was it that, was it that, that Yakubi fellow? Um, oh, I, I couldn't I, tell I, you the, the actual players involved in it, but. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit about it because I, th I find this very interesting. In February of 1958, Bacon and Lacey returned to Tangier. They found the port even more shadowed by the crackdown on vice than during the previous autumn when the new government determined to clean out undesirable elements once and for all. The English-speaking community had felt somewhat protected before, at least if certain implicit rules were followed. Burroughs wrote at one point, so long as I go with Spanish boys, it is like having a girl in the U.S. I mean, you feel yourself at one with society. No one disapproves or says anything. Whereas to walk about town with an Arab boy would be unthinkable at this point. You dig, no one cares what the unbelievers do among themselves. Mm. As part of their assertion of control, the Moroccan government had announced in November while Bacon was back in London that British citizens entering from Gibraltar would henceforth require a visa, a shot across the bow for the expatriates. More important, they again decided to make an example of well-known figures, in particular Ahmed Yacoubi, who had a show at the Hanover Gallery in October. He was a, a painter. Hmm. Upon his return to Tangier from London, the police arrested him for a second time. He languished in jail for five months, during which time his teeth were knocked out. Oof. The second arrest of Yacoubi terrified Paul and Jane Bowell, who had proudly accompanied their protege to London for his exhibition. Jane had also spent time in a psychiatric clinic. <laughs> yeah. They had accompanied Yakubi home to Tangier afterwards. Yakubi, everyone knew, was Paul's lover. Would the police now publicly brand the finicky writer a homosexual and also throw him into a filthy Moroccan prison? So then Bowles is called in for questioning. So it's, and Bacon was friends with Yakubi. So the or Yakubi, whatever is yeah. however you say it. And yeah, so this freewheeling period is like the the bills coming due in some way. Yeah. Yeah. It went on for a while, but then apparently the crackdown ended. And you know, but it was sort of like it was that period was starting to starting to wane and kind of come down, come to an end. Um, he's still gambling and he's about to get his his first um major uh retrospective at the tate which at mm -hmm. the time was in a different building than it is now now it's my favorite museum in the world uh it's it's um it's in a like an old um like an old power plant uh right on the south Interesting. bank yeah. oh it's uh, yeah yeah uh, one of my favorite things to do is to 
put on headphones, listen to the downward spiral and walk around the, the Tate after <laughs> yeah, getting all I mean, jacked up on espresso. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jacob, have you, have you ever had the pleasure to, to see the Tate Modern? I have not, no. Oh, one day, I've my friend. To, I've been to Italy. That's the only European country I've been to. And obviously the museums there are very cool, like the oh, Uffizi yeah. and stuff in Florence and stuff. But no, I have not been to uh, jolly old England. There's, there's still time, man. I've I mean, actually been, I've actually been to Tangiers. <laughs> oh, yeah, is yeah, that right? I didn't a weird, know that. That's a weird little. It's a, it's a cool place. It's a, it's interesting. It's a little different than the rest of Morocco. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the seaside has been um, uh, modernized and turned into sort of a beach marina area for like tourists and whatnot. But there, you can still, you can still feel the seedy underbelly or the echoes of it. Anyway, it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting place. I like it. I like places like that. We're going to look at another painting, and this is a painting that he did right in the uh, run-up to this Tate retrospective, which, again, the importance of this, we can't overstate. The only more important showing in his lifetime would come later uh, when he would get an exhibition at the Grand Palais in Paris. But this would be, this is like him being anointed on home soil, this is important. So he painted this this piece in the run up to it. Uh, this is uh, called Three Studies for a Crucifixion." Uh, Jacob, do you care to describe this? Yeah, absolutely. It is uh, well, and it's interesting just to the sort of, you know, at the beginning of his career, he was only at the base of the crucifixion. But now that he's on top with the retrospective, he's actually able now to do the you know, the whole, the real crucifixion show itself. Um, it's, as the title suggests, it's another uh, triptych. And in the first panel, there's like, it looks like a couple of uh, probably some of, they look like they would be some of his uh, colony club friends. Like they have that very sort of Soho underworld vibe in the background. And then in the foreground, it looks like, a couple of slabs of meat like it has like that sort of bone and rib kind of thing and very red there's a lot of red and uh black and orange in this mm -hmm. and then the middle mm -hmm. panel is like it's a bed and it just looks like a pile of like tissue and like blood and as in like human tissue not like tissue paper mm -hmm. and it's just like looks like a big mass of gore. And then the third panel is it looks like uh it's uh you know a big sort of rocky freezer style slab of meat. Um kind of in a bit of a one of his you know like usual sort of like cubes kind of thing. Um and then sort of like ringed by like, I don't know, almost looks like a crown of bone or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This reminds me of two things to say about that. That's, that's a great description. Hey, remember when uh, early on in the, the, the Podesta, when that Podesta guy was becoming known a known quantity and there's floating around the internet images of art that Podesta had in his house. And one of yeah. them was a gold statue of uh, in the, in following Je the way that Jeffrey Dahmer had positioned a body of his victim. This reminds me of that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first painting we've looked at so far where they've all been disturbing. This one makes me think like just serial killers, something there, we, we've got something in here of that. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's something that he's been saying quietly is out loud in this painting. That's um, yeah. We're into actual body horror. Yeah, absolutely. We, we haven't seen I, any of the ones we've looked at yet. And that's sort of underlined to me by those two figures in the first panel, mm -hmm. because it's like with like if it, absent of them, this would just be sort of like, I don't know, disembodied, you know, mm -hmm. not, pun unintended, you know, mm -hmm. disembodied slabs of gore and meat. But because you have these two figures and especially the figure on the left, he looks like he's looking at you and sort of like 
uh, like sort of looking like leering at you and sort of like laughing. And yeah. you just get this sort of like suggestion that like the, the, all the, the, all the things we're seeing in this uh, triptych were acts committed by those two people. Yeah. And I think that first triptych on the left, it's almost like you're looking down your own legs at them. Like you could be laying in oh, bed, yeah, looking, point. looking down your body at these people as they like leave. They've committed some unspeakable crime against you. <laughs> That's left you, you know, denuded or whatever, you know, f- your skin removed. And <laughs> oh man, uh. <laughs> it really is the stuff of nightmares. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so uh, on the 24th of May, 62 Bacon had his first retro- retrospective exhibition at the Tate Gallery of 92 paintings. For this show, the artist paints a series of works, including three studies for a crucifixion. The Times art critic heralds Bacon's show as the most stunning exhibition by a living British painter there has been since the war. And on the opening day of the show, Bacon receives a telegram informing him of the death the previous day of his companion Peter Lacey in Tangier. So he gets his show at the Tate and he gets a telegram during the celebrations. Uh, Jeez. Farson even describes it. Everyone's he shows up to the party thinking everybody's going to be over the moon. Mm-hmm. And Francis is, you know, torn up. Right. Like, sure. Oh, my God. Peter Lacey's dead. And that really brings an end to um to the Tangier period. I'm going to read a little bit from the Farsan book. So he, he goes to talk to um, some, uh, some people who knew Lacey in Tangier. Was it true that Francis used to get beaten up? I asked later when we were sitting in their garden. Yes, there was no doubt about that. Peter Lacey used to, uh, to get beaten up, said Paul. Lacey was impossible with Moroccan pickups when he was drunk. So even Peter Lacey would get the shit kicked out of him down in Tangier by Arabs. <laughs> if you start beating up a Moroccan, he starts beating you up, Peter pointed out. Evidently in Tangier, Bacon and Lacey frequently went separate ways. I learned that Francis's great friend in Tangier was a Moroccan known as the Gorilla. Oh he wouldn't attract me, said Peter, but he was a very nice man and still polite if I see him. Around this time, Lacey had a relationship with the lesbian sister of a Scot named uh, called James Duncan, who ran the Golden Beach Bar. Surely Lacey was good for Francis, I asked. Terrible, said Peter. A horror, Paul agreed. He explained, Francis had a need for that kind of affair. Francis was desperately in love with him. It was obsessional. Peter Lacey was flinging pictures out of the window wherever they went, said Peter dryly. He had an uncontrollable rage. Trails of canvas were flung from their hotels. He was strikingly handsome, Paul conceded. I always saw him as a romantic figure, I ventured. Any fighter pilot was romantic. (laughs) <laughs> uh, said Peter. He had a funny arrogance, said Paul, trying to be kinder about everything and everybody. But when you heard him playing the piano like Sinatra sings, you'd think, no, he couldn't have done anything so nasty. Peter sighed. He was drunk and desperate and self-destructive. Um, yeah. Hmm. One of the saddest times in Battersea, in London, when the relationship with... Uh, uh, between Francis and Peter Lacey was very strong and they were exchanging letters was when he received a card, which wasn't as warm as it should be. I remember him holding up the card and he looked so sad that I realized he was very much in love with Lacey. Um, This is crazy though. Uh, When we were alone and Francis showed me the welts across his back, um, <laughs> This confirmed my reluctance uh, to sort of look at them. Um, so his point here, Farson's point here is the masochist is stronger than the sadist. And Lacey's vulnerability may have explained Francis's obsession. Uh, Francis's obsession. Yeah. With Lacey's death, the tangerine days were over for Francis. He had enjoyed them, though he admitted to Peter Pollock that he thought the beat poets, Burroughs and Ginsburg and their entourage, romantically poor with their American express cards. <laughs> now that Lacey was dead, the uh, the reason to be in uh, Tangier was gone. And Francis was established as Britain's foremost artist. All right. We've still got, got a little more time to go. We still have one great love affair to go. 
Uh, so we're going to keep on keeping on. Um, he would draw or he would, he would do a painting after um, Peter Lacey's death. He went back to Tangier and I believe he painted this um, there. And this is called landscape near Malabata. And this is um, kind of his requiem for Peter Lacey. So while I get my next uh, round of material prepared, oh. Brad, can you have a look, look at this? What yeah, do you see here? Yeah, this is, uh, huh. It's, um, it's quite different than anything else we've looked at. It's, it's a sort of, a, I don't even really know how, I mean, this is borderline. I know he sort of rails against abstract expressionism, but this is borderline uh, abstract. Uh, you've got a middle kind of swirling area with uh, that's uh, red with blacks and grays. And then out just outside of that there's some kind of cyclo black cyclonic kind of figure and it's on a sort of foreground that makes me think of like the desert with long shadows or something i don't really know what i'm looking at like it feels almost like and as maybe it's just the color scheme and the the shapes there's almost like a bullfighting quality to it but i really don't I really don't know what I'm that's looking very, at. That's <laughs> very interesting because you're. we're going to get ahead. You know, the very last painting uh, that he was to do, it, I think he did it in Spain. He may have done it before he went to Spain, um, yeah. was of a bull. Oh, uh, really? Really? Yeah. So, yeah, this is, prob this is probably among the most abstract of his of his work. And, you know, the, the metaphor here seems to be that, you know, the figure has died. Peter mm. Lacey is gone. Mm. This is almost like a swirling remnant of of a memory. Yeah. Um, what do you think? What do you think, Jacob? Yeah, it's interesting. It kind of like at first blush at like, I don't know, it looks like a bowl of like Moroccan food or something like that, or like a Persian rug or something. But yeah, it definitely has like has like an amphitheater quality and like the sort of the black streaks of like the cyclone it like reminds me of like that opening line from uh the dark tower where it's like the gunmen or like <laughs> yeah. something the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger yeah. followed yeah. or like looney tunes like <laughs> wily e. coyote kind of thing like mm -hmm. i don't know it's interesting because it's like arguably his like because it is so abstract it's like arguably his like most pleasant painting to mm. look at mm -hmm. because it's so like removed from like it's hard to even like tell what things are supposed to be so you're like all right i mean it could be depicting like a horrible yeah massacre <laughs> yeah. or whatever yeah like is this an open a uh, close-up of an open wound yeah yeah I, I... and so it's interesting that it's like you know the tragedy of Lacey's death basically rendered him unable to like you know you do his usual subject matter and like you know during heartbreak only like abstraction can prevail or something yeah, like that Yeah, interesting now i did notice as you were talking if you look at the top of the, uh, the 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 upper third or so of the painting is all black and if you look at right in the middle at the boundary between that and the color section it's sort of black on black but i do get the impression of a face yeah, it looks like a skull. It does look yeah. like a skull. It's mm. like a face on Mars kind of thing. Uh, mm. I, I'm assuming mm. that's intentionally there as a as a as a the faintest image of a face you could possibly have. <laughs> like you mm. almost can't see it at certain angles. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. I want to get a little more of Francis's voice in here. Uh, I, I know we're going long, but I, I'm going to do it. Uh, we're trying to make the definitive piece of content <laughs> for Art of Darkness for Bacon. This yeah. is from a, a BBC interview uh, that David Sylvester did, 1962. Um, this is worth looking up. You can look this up. David Sylvester, Francis Bacon interview. Um you may not want to tell a story, but you certainly seem to want subjects with a lot of dramatic charge when you choose a theme like the crucifixion. Can you say what impelled you to do the triptych? We're talking about the last triptych we looked at. Mm -hmm. um, this is around the Tate retro retrospective. Bacon, I've always been very moved by pictures about slaughterhouses and meat. 
And to me, they belong very much to the whole thing of the crucifixion. They've been extraordinary. There have been extraordinary photographs which have been done of animals just being taken up before they were slaughtered and the smell of death. We don't know, of course, but it appears by these photographs that they're so aware of what is going to happen to them. They do everything to attempt to escape. I think these pictures were, were very much based on that kind of thing, which to me is very, very near the whole thing of the crucifixion. I know for religious people, for Christians, the crucifixion has a totally different significance. But as a non-believer, it was just an act of man's behavior, a way of behavior to another. Uh, yeah. And is it the sort of mood uh, implicit in some unique and possibly tragic situation that you want above all. No, I think especially as I grow older, I want something much more specific than that. I want a record of an image. And with the record of the image, of course, comes a mood because you can make an image without, you can't make an image without cr it's creating a mood. So just hmm. very interesting. Yeah. You could go on and on with this interview, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move past it. If you're, if you're into this, definitely seek that interview out. We're going to kind of blast forward here. I'm going to, there's going to be a fun little anecdote of uh, Francis Bacon at a party because, of course, now he's the most famous living painter in Britain. Um, and uh, he <laughs> that, does that not... would be that would be fun to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun <laughs> for a little yeah. bit at least? Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> so I'm going to read this story. If Princess Margaret has a memory of Francis Bacon, it is unlikely to be happy. His presence at a party could be a time bomb, and in this case, it went off. The posher the occasion, the more outrageously he could behave. Lady Carolyn Blackwood remembers a ball given by Lady Rothmere. Champagne flowed so abundantly that the princess was seized by a desire to show off. She grabbed the microphone from the startled singer and then instructed the band to play songs by Cole Porter. All the guests who had been waltzing under the vast chandeliers instantly stopped dancing. They stood like Buckingham Palace sentries called to attention to watch the royal performance. Princess Margaret knew the songs by heart, but she sang them hopelessly off-key, egged on by her sycophantic audience of ladies laden with jewelry and gentlemen penguins in white ties and tails. They shouted and they roared and they asked for more. Unfortunately, according to Lady Carolyn, Princess Margaret became a little manic at receiving such approval and started wiggling around in her crinoline and Tiara as she tried to mimic the sexual movements of the professional entertainer. Her dress, with its petticoats bolstered by the wooden hoops that ballooned her skirts, was unsuitable for the slinky act, but all the rapturous applause seemed to make her forget this. She was starting on the familiar lyrics of Let's Do It when a very menacing and unexpected sound came from the back of the crowded ballroom. It grew louder and louder until it eclipsed Princess Margaret's singing. It was the sound of jeering and hissing, a prolonged and thunderous booing. Princess Margaret faltered in mid-lyric. Mortification turned her face scarlet, and then it went ashen. Because she looked close to tears, her smallness of stature suddenly made her look rather pitiful. The princess abandoned the microphone and was hurried out of the ballroom by her flustered ladies-in-waiting as the band stopped playing, uncertain what to do, and Lady Rothermere's guests asked each other what happened. A man whose face was already red but was now apoplectic with rage told Carolyn, it was that dreadful man, Francis Bacon. He calls himself a painter, but he does the most frightful paintings. I just don't understand how a creature like him was allowed to get in here. It's really quite disgraceful. Afterwards, <laughs> afterwards, Francis said her singing was really too awful. Someone had to stop her. If you're going to do something, you shouldn't do it as badly as that. <laughs> also, of course, he was drunk. Considering that it was uh, gallant, if vain, of the princess to get up and sing in the first place, his reaction was cruel. Yet Francis had an anarchic fearlessness, which was unique. Hmm. Carolyn wrote admiringly, I can think of no one else who would have dared to boo a member of the royal family in a private house. <laughs> Among all the guests assembled in later Rothermere's ballroom, more than a few were secretly suffering from Princess Margaret singing, but they suffered in silence, gagged by their snobbery. Francis could not be gagged. If he found a performance shoddy, no conventional trepidation prevented him from expressing his reactions. Sometimes his opinions could be biased and perverse and unfair, but he never cared if they created outrage. Lord Rothermere cannot remember saying it, but it has been reported that when introduced to Francis at an, at an anniversary party for the Daily Mail in 1990, he asked, and what do you do? I'm an old poof, 
said Francis. <laughs> <laughs> so you know he's he's hard not to he's hard not to love, um, dude. If you if you're the most famous painter in England and you can't jeer royalty, what is it all worth, really? Hundred hundred percent, hundred percent. So we're going to meet now. Uh, George Dyer. And for the third and final time, I'm going to mention this is the uh, the subject of Love is the Devil. If you want to watch that film where Daniel Craig plays George Dyer, you can get kind of a, I don't know, a, it's like a 90 minute quick, quick hit of Francis Bacon. It's a very good film. Hmm. Uh, if that film is taken to be gospel and actually they they um they worked with this Daniel Farson character mm. um, on the making of that film. They give him like credit. Um, it, it almost looks like Dyer like broke into Francis's studio. And then oh. Francis offered said, there's nothing in there for you, but why don't you come into the bedroom? Mm. Uh, you know, and I don't know if it went down quite like that, but it's, right. a, you know, it's a nice kind of vibe for sure. Yeah. Um, Dyer was an East end thug, thuggish type. Uh, who um, was very was a bit of a softy though at heart. He wanted mm. to kind of cuddle and be cuddled, and Francis mm. wanted to be uh, beaten and raped. Mm. So there were they were a little bit at at ends from jump. Um, mm. It was a very uh, fraught relationship, which would lead to some very dramatic um, events, including um, a court appearance for Francis, mm. which which I'll get to. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about George Dyer. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, this chapter is called The Lost Soul of George Dyer. Uh, Once in the Golden Lion, a young hustler proudly showed me the trouser, trousers he had just been given, explaining that they were cavalry twill. His mistake was heartbreaking. Uh, I sense that whatever hill he landed on, he was bound to be crucified. George Dyer used the lion too. And I saw him there frequently, usually sitting on his own, staring into his glass with the same vulnerability. Though he had been a minor villain, I understood that his crimes had been petty. And though his looks were hard, he was hopelessly weak. There was an innocence about George, even a sweetness, which was touching, but his hopelessness made him dangerous. He had old fashioned manners and would stand up when he saw me asking if I wanted a drink. Relishing his role as confidant, Deacon, the photographer, had a genuine affection for George, apart from his usefulness as a meal ticket in his capacity as Francis's new friend. Deacon also teased him, which George enjoyed. I doubt if anyone had teased him before because of his air of latent violence. George had a slight speech impediment, as if the words were struggling to break free, which added to his emotional, if not physical, vulnerability. Wearing excellent, soberly cut suits paid for by Francis, he could have been a city businessman until you heard his strangled East End accent. The combination had considerable charm. Hmm. Peter Bradshaw recalled an afternoon when George sat beside him at the Kismet Club in one of the banquettes and poured his heart out. I don't know, Peter. I can't cope with it all. Everyone thinks I'm on to a good thing, thinks George has got it made. They don't realize how difficult it is. I don't know what to do. It's like I'm using him as a walking stick. Yeah, Peter imitated the pronunciation. Walking stick. I can't do an East End. <laughs> he too was fond of George and said it was sad to see him so unhappy. Next time I saw him in a Chelsea pub and he borrowed a pound off me. Usually George was loaded with money supplied by Francis, even if only to keep him quiet. Um. Mm. Yeah. So, right. There was the trouble for George inevitably acquired a coterie. He always had hangers on and the lion said, Peter, he didn't like it, but he couldn't shake them off. Sometimes there were as many as six blokes, but he wasn't strong enough. He felt trapped and couldn't see any way out. Also, he was lonely and grateful for their company. If he paid for everyone, it gave him a semblance of self-respect. Some people may wonder what Francis saw in him. After all, he was hardly the Nietzsche of the football team. Presumably, the answer is simply the threat and the actuality of violence. Start with at least. So, all right. So now George Dyer is on the scene. Um, pretty intense. I've got a little bit more about that. Um, let me see. Yeah, I mean, he he uh, he kind of tagged along. Um, at one point, to kind of get rid of him, uh, Francis sent George to Tangier. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, just to get rid of him. Huh. People started to dread his arrival. 
Um, this is someone talking about George. He would uh, come to the pergola in the middle of the day in a full city dress suit and get steadily drunk and not know how to cope, getting more and more sloshed as, as he sat there during long lunches. I disliked mm-hmm. him very much. Francis was never here at the time. He'd go flying off. But but George was sent out here to get him out of the way, chaperoned by Denis, who got equally drunk. Uh, yeah, this is intense. Didn't George enjoy himself at all? I asked wistfully. Did he make any friends? George didn't want the Moroccans. He liked little boys. Really, said Peter. I never thought of him like that. I didn't think he was interested in sex. I do know that on one of the visits, he was so drunk that I drove him to the airport, terrified that British Airways wouldn't take him. I was thankful (laughs) to see him go. So George becomes um, a bit of a liability very quickly. There's a lot of drama. There's some more here, which is going to foreshadow what's to come. I asked, and this is this is our friend uh, Daniel Farson. I asked about the legendary incident when the manager phoned Francis to warn him that George was trying to jump from his bedroom window. He's on the 19th floor, isn't he? Then let him jump. He won't feel a thing. Oh Jeff laughed. God. I'm not sure about that. But what I do know, because I was there, is that the, a phone call came through to say that George had tried to commit suicide, but that Francis would be glad to hear he had been saved by the house doctor. Francis asked what George had done. He took an overdose of sleeping pills, said the manager. Is the doctor still there? Yes, Mr. Bacon. Then tell him to write another prescription so he can do the job properly. Oh, my God. (laughs) So this this gets really out of hand. The implication is like, well, here, let's look at let's look at George now. Uh, There's a painting called Three Studies for a Portrait of George Dyer. George Dyer was a model for for Francis. I mean, he was he was handsome i mean daniel <laughs> daniel craig plays him in the in the film right. it's not it's not you know terrible casting i mean he was a handsome rough rugged yeah. yeah yeah uh huh jacob when you get a chance can you what do you what do you oh. see here in this portrait and this is this is a it's good to to do this too because in this period francis was doing a lot of portraits uh and this is a triptych yeah so this, this is, one is arguably uh bacon sort of most like picasso-esque it like almost has like a cubism quality to it um it's weird because it's sort of distorted and mutated like you can kind of get a sense that maybe he like saw some like sick burns or whatever in that like anatomical book that he had Mm -hmm. um and like drew up like it has like a sort of like necrotic quality but like compared to his like some of his other works that we've looked at tonight like this one is like almost like pleasant to look at like you know compared to like the crucifixion ones like i'm not sort of uh you know i'm not as repulsed by it as those ones you know yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the central one despite the coloration there is a sort of a dreamy or a peaceful quality to the face in the central in the central one and and the other ones don't seem quite as disturbed the the sort of expression that's hid up hidden under the distortions don't seem there's no screaming in this these um and yet at the same time like now that i know more about frank i've seen this one before i think i tweeted this this painting out at one point um it, and now that I know more about Francis Bacon's sort of predilections in his history, these do look like it, maybe the kind of pulp you could beat someone's face into, though, <laughs> you know, right. potentially like right. mashed and misshapen and bloody and bruised up and things. And yet there's a little bit of a hint of peace or smile under it. I, I don't know that mm. that's what he's getting at, but that's the impression yeah. that I, I take from it. Well, this is one of roughly 40 triptychs in the small format. Each was uh, measuring 11 by 14 inches, each portrait. Mm. Um, this is one of five um, of Dyer. So Dyer was a was a serious uh, muse. This yeah. would eventually be sold in 2017 following a single telephone bid for $38.6 million. And again, 11 by 14 inches. This isn't some massive piece. So no, it's, yeah, that's quite small. Bacon's uh, go for big money. So, all right. So apparently George had erectile dysfunction. Francis kind of amass- would emasculate him. Oh, yeah. um, they had bad fights. There was drinking. And this is depicted in that film I've mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, at some point, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, George Dyer calls the police on Francis saying that there's marijuana in Francis's studio. Oh, God. So, yeah, the police searched the studio. So he, he's, he, he was enraged, um, you know, uh, uh, because Francis, because of some, they had some row, as you can about imagine. Mm. The police searched the studio with two dogs trained to sniff out drugs, and Colonel led them, led them to a pipe containing 2.1 grams of cannabis and silver paper in the bottom of a paint box underneath a pile of underclothes. Given the chaos of the studio and the likely state of the underwear, the raid had an element of farce, especially as Colonel was Ronnie Cray's nickname. Um, the case was serious for Francis. If he was convicted of possessing drugs, he would be prevented from entering the United States. His gallery was alarmed and in due co- course, um, a, a fancy lawyer was, um, uh, retained to, to defend him. Um, you know, and their case was like, look, I, I've had people come in throughout the years and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't also, I also look at this place. Like, right. I don't know what yeah. any of this stuff is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've... So the, the sense that, that I get from this is that like, um, the judge kind of, kind of read the room and figured out like what was going on. This was like a, like a homosexual, um, like spat. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then Georgian, Georgian, and, um, uh, Francis, they kept their, their relationship going. Oh my God. Um, so here we go. We're getting ready. So we're, we're blasting through to the early seventies. Uh, Francis has his eyes on Paris and now he's going to get the, um, the exhibition at the grand Palais in Paris in 1971, which I think he was the only English painter to receive such an honor. Hmm. Turner may have, I can't exactly recall. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Cause I want to get that right. Um, Francis Bacon, grand play. It was a massive honor. I, hmm. th- this would just be like, this would be like winning the Nobel prize. Um, right, right, right. Just an absolute, um, you know, huge coup. And this was what year did you say? 72? 71. 71. Um, so, and it showed, uh, 108 of his of his works um wow and we're talking about like royalty and i mean everybody who's had anybody comes well probably through feelings of responsibility loyalty or even lingering vestiges of affection francis took george to paris for the grand opening of his exhibition at the grand palais in october of 1971 uh now they stayed in the Hotel de Saint Pere, and this story is pretty intense. So Dyer arrives. Dyer's drinking and act, kind of acting out, acting crazy. He's got an Arab rent boy in the room. Francis can't even stand it. He goes to one of the because he, he, you know, Francis took a took a um, you know, an entourage there, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And uh so Francis didn't even stay in the room. And now this is what happened. <sighs> uh they stayed in the Hotel de Saint Pere, where George Dyer's body was discovered in his bathroom on the morning of the 24th of October. One story has it that the news of the death was brought to Francis later in the day as he waited to receive the Minister of Culture on top of the steps leading to the Grand Palais with the flags waving, the band playing, and the guard of honor saluting. As they went inside for the opening, one of the first paintings to attract the minister's attention was one of George Dyer's on the lavatory, an eerie prophecy of George's death on the hotel lavatory, with blood streaming from every orifice. In fact, this story is inaccurate. George had committed suicide 36 hours earlier. Later that day, Francis had attended a lavish reception hosted by Madame Pompidou. The news of the tragedy had been brought to him there, or he had learned of it a a few hours or perhaps even minutes earlier. This remains unclear. Francis Bacon had entered arm in arm with Isabel Lambert, his close friend and a subject of numerous portraits, whom he introduced to the gatherings of higher ups. It was the very moment George died, Isabel told Tony and Pippi Smith, and there was a great to do. I was sworn to secrecy, but said I didn't have any secrets. 
it was all hush hush hushed up says ian very hush hush you know it could have fucked up the whole exhibition with more about george's death than the show now the fact is um george george committed suicide uh here's what francis said that was an awful thing to have done francis accused him what will people think after all they are only simple folk and won't understand now he he's convinced that the timing was deliberate now right. there's and there's some ambi- yeah there's some amb- ambivalence about this because if you there are different stories the there's a theory and i don't know if it's totally true i think this is how they show it in the in the film i keep talking about mm-hmm. but there's an idea that they found his body and conspired Bacon, one of his entourage, and the hotel manager conspired to hide the body for two days in the hotel. Oh, wow. And that it came out during the dinner that he had died during like one of the big reception dinners. Yeah. But they were um, trying to, they were trying not to spoil the whole event and all right. This. Be- yeah. Because D- Dyer was in many of the paintings that were on display. Right. Right. Oh, Try and God. imagine that. Try and imagine that. Oh my uh, God! And so they hid this body. I mean, and and, and that's that's a crime, right? That's yeah, a crime. You, you do don't that. you don't report yeah. an overdose and a death, but but apparently that's what happened. Oh um, my God! Which is heavy. Yeah. Well, so and then heavy. you've got now you've got bacon with this of this this event, and then the uh, the previous um uh, the previous major uh showing. I don't can't remember if it was the Tate retrospective or whatever when he finds out that Paul Lacey dies. So he's got these these big sort of tent pole um, events where he's being recognized, and both of them are marred by the death, like the at the time death of a lover. That's isn't that's, that it's that's just crazy, crazy, yeah. absolutely yeah. crazy. So we're gonna and you know and he and he had to pretend he didn't know he was dead when the news came out at the at the dinner so it has it has the the vibe getting back to what jacob said earlier of this is like a greek drama you couldn't yeah yeah you know if you you if you wrote a play and had this happen you almost wouldn't believe it oh. um so we're going to look at uh another painting and i'm probably going to blast through a lot of the uh the sort of the uh later period in his life but we're going to look at a a triptych May through June 1973, which uh, he he made, he painted after uh, Dyer's death. He came back to Paris. He stayed in the same hotel. Um, and this this painting is a reflection on on the death of George Dyer. George Dyer's suicide on the on the toilet in the in the um, the hotel in uh, Paris. So what do you see here, Brad? This is another triptych. Yeah, it's triptych. It looks like. Uh... It looks like a goblin trying to hide the body. Uh, <laughs> it kind of does, doesn't it? A little bit. Um, like on the left, you've got a, a sort of slumped, very Baconian figure, you know, humanoid, but distorted, clearly on the toilet within a door frame. The next you do, you have kind of this in the same door frame, but the toilet and that that figure are gone. You definitely have like some kind of gobliny sort of figure in, in, a, in a shadow spilling out into the foreground um and then in the right you've got a, a gobliny kind of figure doing something at a sink kind of cleaning up or something um I, i'm would sketch my eye now in the left and the right panel now is this little white penta- uh, mm. pentagon pentagon like, well there's like a little arrow yeah a couple of arrows yeah yeah I, i'm not sure we'll exactly what to make of that um yeah, yeah this is a yeah. scene this is the closest well that 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 three uh the the actual crucifixion image is is kind of narrative but this does seem to have a narrative to it mm. uh that's clearly the suicide being represented um mm. and clearly some kind of cleanup or distress at the in the bathroom uh is happening it's yeah, this is sad. yeah. This is one of of three of the quote unquote black triptychs. Um, yeah. hmm. th- I mean, this is just this to me. It just is so um, staggeringly sad. Uh, and th- I mean, you're looking at a master at the height of his power uh, yeah. here. 
Well, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to blast through some stuff here. I still got a few things to cover. Um, you know, we might we might get into the beginning of a fourth hour. And then, of course, we're going to do the after dark and we're going to figure mm-hmm. out which dictator. Yep. Um, but let's let's rock and roll. So now after the Grand Palais, I mean, just forget about it. It's it's there's no more famous painter in Europe, uh, in England, um, in, in Britain, in France. Um, you know, he's revered by the French. Uh his work is used during the open cre- opening credits of the Marlon Brando film, Last Tango in Paris. Mm. Uh, you know, so now, I mean, he's even being seen in a, in a much sort of wider way. Mm. Um, he would have uh, something, something of a kind of a paternal relationship with a man named John Edwards, um, who uh, I think ran like a gay club in London. Um, I, I believe Edwards would eventually um, be be uh, given the estate. Um, in 1995, he had his second Tate retrospective, which for a living mm-hmm. artist is exceedingly uh, rare, if not unique. Uh, so, you know, and at this point we're talking about you know, his paintings would go for, were already starting to go for millions and millions of dollars um, in the 80s. Um, uh, Muriel Belcher would pass away. The colony would kind of fade away. You start to think about a man who was born in, what, 1909 in mm-hmm. Ireland, living to see London in the 80s. I mean, yeah. I, I, I we do this so often on our show, but I just love to over the course of doing one of these profiles, you just, just think of all the changes and all the life someone like that has seen. Um, yeah. 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 So there was a period at the very end where he, he had a, uh, a lover simply called the Spaniard. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> which, uh, yeah, why not? Uh, so let me, let me read a little bit about the Spaniard. Uh, uh, and this is from Farson again. My God, I exclaimed, you've done it at last. What have I done? Asked Francis. You found the Nietzsche of the football team. <laughs> oh, I have, have I? Perhaps you're right. How has everyone taken it? They say he's only after my money. Did that hurt you? Not really. You see, he has money of his own. Anyhow, all my life, people have only wanted to know me because of my money or my work. So there it is. <laughs> um, and then, uh, as for the Spaniard, uh, I have the fear that he vanished from the scene because no one bothered to include him. Uh, this is this is after Francis's passing, which we're coming up to. I sent a letter for I wanted him to know of the happiness he brought Francis when it came, like a long lost reward. Though I did not use such high flutin words to him, I doubt if the letter found him. But if he should read this book, I hope he will realize how much he meant to Francis at a time when he was very lonely. Toward the end of his life, uh, Farson sort of describes Bacon. And this is something I didn't really touch on during the episode, but Bacon and his coterie, they were sort of acutely aware of how difficult it is to age as a gay man, that that the culture is kind of youth obsessed. And he was very he was pretty there were times he was lonely. Yeah. Um, I think William S. Burroughs had that same thing. Yeah. 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 I, I skipped over one of one of my favorite anecdotes. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it and, and in the interest of time i'll just ad lib it but there was a bacon was at a party uh and someone asked him oh what do you do and bacon mm-hmm. said i'm a painter and the the man uh the man replied well how how well you know how fortunate uh I, you know i i i just bought a new house and i need it i need it painted <laughs> and francis <laughs> said sure you know something like yeah wonderful yeah yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Like, oh yeah not God. not that kind of painter do you know right, right, um right anyway so uh francis had brought the spaniard to the colony nine months earlier and he returned shortly after francis's death for a meeting with john edwards and stayed for a few words with ian board and michael wojas who told me i think he was in love with francis the way he talked he was almost in tears so he was a, a you know a romantic uh up until the end uh, we're going to look at one more painting, uh, maybe two more paintings real quick. Um, that, that bit about, 
uh, being a painter was so funny though. I Oof. wish I, I wish I'd written that down. I just think it's so funny. You know, you can achieve <laughs> heights of fame to that yeah. degree. And some yeah. stock broker is like, Oh, you want to paint my house? Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, you're a painter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, what do you do? I'm just an old poof. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so much fun. Uh, so let me see. So the, these are some of his thoughts on death. I want to read this. Good old Francis. He's somebody I don't know. He he's legitimately somebody that would have been fun to to like, you know, hang out with. There are some other. I mean, there are some other anecdotes that I'm that I'm skipping over. That if you get the Sparson book, they're really funny. You know, um, things things that he would say to uh, to different artists. Um, yeah. Let's get, let's see here. I'm sure. I mean, he's just sort of a no filter kind of person. Right. And mm-hmm. very articulate, very intelligent with unique opinions. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is one point that I do want to get over. Alistair Hicks reported a conversation in which Francis expressed it, his envy of tradition from 3000 to 2000 BC. The magnificent art in Egypt was being made by craftsmen. There is a lot of craft in painting. The Egyptians were attempting to defeat death. Are modern artists attempting to defeat death? No. The difference is they believed in an afterworld. I don't. Man now realizes that he is an accident, that he is a completely futile being, that he has to play out the game without purpose other than uh, than of his own choosing. So we're dealing with like a serious, seriously nihilistic uh, person. Yeah. Um, you know, at this point, too, his doctor said that, you know, your heart is in such a bad state uh, that not a single ventricle is functioning. Oh, He'd rarely seen such a diseased organ. If he had one more drink or yeah. even became excited, it could kill him. I feel uh, like Francis Bacon would be like, really? My heart's that bad. Do you have like a photo I can look at? Or... <laughs> right? Yeah, that might be my next trip day. Right. Uh, you know, he, he told all his friends that diagnosis and then ordered a bottle of champagne. Sure. That's what we're dealing yeah. with. So, yeah. um, uh, well, let's come to the death here. So, well in holiday, Bacon was admitted to the private Clinica Rubert in Madrid in 1992, which he was alive when we were alive, yeah, that's, 1992, that's yeah. where he was cared for by the handmaids of Maria. His chronic asthma, which had plagued him all his life, had developed into a more severe respiratory condition, and he could not talk or breathe very well. He died of a heart attack on the 28th of April, 1992. He bequeathed his estate to his heir and sole legatee, John Edwards. In 98, at Edwards' request, Brian Clark, a friend of Bacon and Edwards, was installed as sole executor of the estate by the high court, following the court's severing of all ties between Bacon's former gallery, Marlboro Fine Arts, and his estate. Uh, In 1998, the director of the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin secured Edwards and Clark's donation of the contents of his studio at Seven Reese Mews, South Kensington. The contents of his studio were surveyed, moved, and reconstructed in the gallery. So you can go visit his studio. It sounds like oh, interesting. Dublin. Huh. Um, here's a little bit about the value and his legacy. The Pope's in lar- large triptychs in their time commanded the highest prices at auction. By 1989, Bacon was the most expensive living artist after one of his triptychs sold at Sotheby's for over $6 million. In 2007, actress Sophia Loren consigned Study for Portrait 2 from the estate of her late husband, Carlo Ponti, at Christie's. It was auctioned for the then record price of $27.5 million. In 2008, the triptych, 1976, uh, sold at Sotheby's for $86.28 million, then a record for a work by Bacon and the highest price paid for a post-war work of art at auction up to 2008. In 2013, three studies of Lucian Freud sold at Christie's New York for $142.4 million, surpassing both triptych and 1976 in auction value, and more importantly, claiming the record for highest auction price of a work of art at that time, a title previously held by the fourth version of Edvard Munch's Scream and now held by Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. Hmm. So, wow. Our wow. little, uh, our little boy from uh, from Ireland, <laughs> right? Made it being made hunted it all by by Irish nationalists and beaten by stable boys. Yeah, mm-hmm. made it all the way to being mm-hmm. wow. Mm-hmm. wow. Yep. Well, let's look at one. Let's look at one final painting, and this is uh, one of the paintings he made 
near the end of his life. It's I, I think it's considered his final painting, and it is simply called "Study of a Bull." And uh, Jacob, do you care to describe this painting of the bull? Oh yeah, it's well, it's interesting because you know with this painting and then another, I guess clicked on the another triptych from ninety one, and then the triptych of basically depicting the death of uh george dyer mm -hmm. is like he really by the end of his career he was really kind of getting into minimum like being minimalist compared to how he was before and like the best way that i can like he's like instead of like the bright and lurid like reds and pinks and purples and oranges and stuff it's like beige and white and black and you know it's very subdued and like, you know, the only way I can like think about it in terms of like context of who he is, it's sort of like all of the meat and all the gory bits of the carcass have rotten away. And by the end of his career, it's just like pure gleaming bone. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a metaphysical bull. It's a yeah. it's an idea of a bull and it it does almost suggest this like transition from life until death and death and life. And there's this black doorway and. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It, like looks like an apparition. Yeah, it does. Yeah. One of the horns is white. One of the horns is black. It's, yeah. it's quite beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. He used, he used dust in this painting. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Most of the two meter high painting is deliberately raw canvas. Underneath the bull, Bacon has used real dust from his famously shambolic studio. <laughs> to me, that is terribly poignant, uh, said Harrison. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, an art historian, Martin Harrison. He often used to say, dust is eternal. After all, we all return to dust. Wow. And that is the life of the great English painter by wow. way of Ireland. Quite a life. Francis Eggs Bacon. <laughs> Dang. Quite a life. Quite a man. Mm -hmm. Quite an artist. Quite a good job, Kevin mm. and Jacob. But yes. definitely appreciated your insights and feel like I really learned something tonight about Francis Bacon and about 20th century art and maybe even a little bit about myself. You know? <laughs> That's beautiful, Brad. <laughs> well, <laughs> And for better or worse, we're going to do another half an hour and we're going to talk <laughs> yeah. about the uh, we're going to talk about the dictator that Francis Bacon thought was one of the two most handsome people in the world uh, and who he wanted to be sodomized by in order to, <laughs> to terrorize uh, some of the women. I think uh -huh. I can find that. Uh, ah, here it is. I found that anecdote, which I quite liked. Oh, OK, OK. okay. And this will be what I close the core episode. But I want you to subscribe to the Patreon. If you're subscribed, thank you. If you're not, subscribe. We're at artofdarkpod.com, patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. If you want to hear about this dictator, uh, you're going to need to, to sign up. Uh, we really value your contribution. Jacob, we appreciate you too. You've come, you're a friend of the show. Uh, you know, always happy to have you on. If there's ever a subject we do you want to talk about, you know, look us up. You're always welcome in a dark room episode. Um, but uh, is, before you. I read this final anecdote, is there anything, you, you know, final words you want to say about Francis Bacon for the, uh, the friends and the fans at home? Uh, uh, no, not really. I think. The, I think that sort of final thing about like basically the all of his paintings rotting down to the bone is sort of mm. my final two cents on the matter. Perfect. All right. And remind people where they can find you. Uh, I am on Twitter uh, at Blauer underscore guys, B-L-A-U-E-R underscore G-E-I-S-T. And then also I am the editor and publisher of apocalypse confidential which you can find at apocalypse-confidential.com beautiful all right so let's go here on another occasion at the colony that was memorable we continued uh, from the colony to the french and then the golden lion where francis was in such lively form that someone asked him what he did i'm a painter that's lucky said the man i'm doing up my house at the moment and can give you some work if you want it how very kind of you, said Francis with a broadening smile. 
Only a few days earlier, one of his pictures had sold in New York for three million pounds. <laughs> uh. We're all going to make it, boys. Right. <laughs> We're all going to make it. The crack of the whip. The crack. The masochist is stronger than the sadist. Uh, remember that. Yes. Which, I, which I'm afraid I, after after four hours of this, you two are the stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So take that. I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm. I'm the sadist on this scene. Uh, <laughs> All, right. All right. Jacob guys. Everett, thanks so much. Brad, we're going to come back yep. and we're going to do the After Dark. Artofdarkpod.com, yep. patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs>